I have no views on it whatsoever. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't viewed it. Mm, yeah. I look at sports. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by Cinema Sins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from Cinema Sins, joined as always by the voice of Cinema Sins, Jeremy Scott. Kapow! And from Music Video Sins, Barrett Share. Zing. <laughs> we also have Aaron Dicer here. Hi, 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 Centerinos. And we have Jonathan Watkins here. Woo-hoo! Hello, hello. There are five people in this what? studio. Well, that's too many dicks on the dance floor. That is, that is. <laughs> as Flight of the Concords. <laughs> once said uh <laughs> hey glad to have you guys here this is, <laughs> yeah. this is historic yeah 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 it has have we've done have we done a podcast all five of us in nope, here we've, we've done the, we've done four of us on sif pop uh and then of course we've done four of us for this mm-hmm. but yeah yeah and we've we've done it sin week we were all together but not in the studio no, no. correct oh that's true that's yeah. true yeah and uh yeah we actually we've got uh sif pop is aaron's podcast yep. that he's doing he's been doing for a long time and you two along with danae hughes are mm-hmm. doing behind the sins yeah. mm-hmm. which is which according is according to according to twitter it's just danae hughes but uh, <laughs> oh, there you go what do you give us the elevator pitch for behind the sins uh so we are kind of the b team at cinema sins uh you know you three have been doing syncast for a long time and uh, we wanted to uh, do something that was ours, and so we figured we'd just tell stories about you guys. But, yeah. we, got, but we got a girl. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We're integrated. And then Already got... the most diverse podcast on our network. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I've been on it once. Chris was on it. Is, uh, Chris will the be time. Uh, yeah, because it'll air this week. Yeah, so, yeah. Chris is on it. Uh, so, yeah. So, basically, what we do is we run down the Sins content from the week previous mm-hmm. and just talk about kind of the behind the scenes of how that content was made, some of the fun stories, those kind of things. We have different sections where we'll talk about uh, embarrassing Google searches we had to do mm-hmm. to research Sins, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's a blast. Awesome. Don't Love for you to, yeah, we talk about donuts. Don't know about donuts. Yeah, Ooh. that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we should uh, we should talk about our sin flowers yes. today. We've been we've been negligent, I think, <laughs> um, uh, and we don't mean to be. I think that's what the meaning of it is. Uh, but no, uh, we have a list that we would like to uh, we would like to announce. Today. Dude, it's incredible the members we have of Cinema Sins that support what goes on here. Uh, so we like to give shout outs uh, to the Sinflower list who join us for can join us for Sin Week and support uh, at a certain level. So uh, Isaac, thank you, Jacob, Jeff, John, Joseph, Joshua. <laughs> Karen, Marvin, and Michael, thank you very much. Thank you. It. You're yeah. wonderful. You guys. Now, I do have to actually uh, give a couple more shout outs because get this. There are members who support us at a higher level with no extra benefit. They oh. just want to help us out and give us more money. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to load that one up. holding out for the golden mouth. Yeah, that's, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Does, is that even going to make Which sense? Won't at this make point? any sense so, for another hour. Yeah. So, but then it's going to kill. It, yeah, <laughs> it will right. kill. Uh, so these <laughs> amazing sin flowers are in the tune Sinfinity and Beyond crew, which, uh, basically give above and beyond, uh, with no extra benefit to them. Darren, thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Dexter, Greg, and Michael, awesome. uh, the four of you are absolutely incredible. Awesome. Thank, you, yeah. thank yep. you so much, guys. That's awesome. All right. So today we have, uh, our main topic is something that, uh, that Jeremy, uh, came up with ooh, and uh, it's called the heart of a movie the heart we've got heart you got heart kid that thing in that chest of a movie explain <laughs> alright so the, the, the genesis for all this came about uh, I was watching Jaws this is about two three weeks ago um, and it gets to that speech where he talks about or Quint talks about the USS Indianapolis which is a real boat and the events he described for the most part, a real event. Nicholas Cage was on that boat, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. He well, actually he was he was all over in World War II, um, <laughs> and it it's an amazing speech. And right before he gives it, everything's jovial. They're drinking. They're comparing scars, mm-hmm. and then he starts talking about his oh. scars, and it's rough, man. It's incredible. It's a it's a powerful piece of writing. A powerful piece of acting. But I asked myself, if you take this scene out of the movie, 
even though the shark isn't here right now, I think it completely changes the movie. I think you have a fun action romp with a shark. Yeah. But you don't have an all-timer classic. Mm -hmm. You don't understand the drive exactly. that this captain has in the in the whole pursuit and why he is the way he is without that story. Exactly. And so my, my theory is, now not every movie is going to have a scene like this. And not every movie you're going to be able to find one scene that if you took it out, it would... It would kill the heart of the movie or you're you know but, but a lot of them will yeah and then there's going to be movies where maybe it's up for debate what that scene is uh and so we've all come today prepared with some examples of our own to throw out there of a movie and maybe the scene that is its heart and we can discuss debate punch each other <laughs> call names well it's not ever it's not always obvious because like if you ask i don't know joe somebody off the street about what's the pivotal scene in jaws they could say, well, when the shark eats the, the girl at the beginning, right? Mm. Or it's the scene where Quint does the, the scratching on the chalkboard mm. and all that stuff. Or it's the scene where the mayor tries to bully Brody and all that. But no, you're absolutely... When, when Jeremy said this to me the first time, I had to pause for a second because I was like, all the tendrils that that movie informs, both during, before, and afterwards, like that makes everything on a rewatch, everything before that more potent because you realize how dangerous this is 1100 men went in yeah only 200 came out yeah. that kind of thing and you're like holy shit this is th we know how dangerous bruce is but it's not like to the level that he describes on the uss right. indianapolis i took this as uh, a scene in the movie that is initially you find it to be separate from what you came in Ooh. to see the movie for mm uh and that it is and it and it seems innocuous but there are things that are in that scene that inform you of basically the whole movie mm -hmm. or or are important in a certain way that we that you didn't think of and so that's what i ended up that's a great way to interpret it mm -hmm. i think i mean i think there's lots of different ways we could in minute ways approach this differently i think that's what's going to be fun about well, it. well and if you know the behind the scenes of that scene too it makes it even more interesting Dreyfus and uh, Shaw mm. hating each other and not getting along. It's been different reports, but there's been different reports of who actually wrote that scene. But a lot of people say it was the night before. Some people say they were drunk when they wrote it. Mm -hmm. There's just all kinds of stories about how that scene even came together. Maybe Dreyfus is. A, there's a story about Dreyfus not liking um, working with. Uh, what about Bob? Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Yeah. Yeah. He <laughs> no, I him. think I think Dreyfus is difficult, but I think the thing with Shaw was. I don't know if he was method, but he was definitely trying to be the part of the captain, and he figured the captain would be picking on Hooper. Interesting. So I think there was probably a lot of that too. Shaw also had uh, alcoholism. Oh yeah, Shaw had a lot. He of was issues. like uh, always. I, that, I don't know if on this. I think on this movie I for think sure he was yeah was uh was drunk a lot. Um, I had I've heard like different stories on different movies. I don't know if the Sting he was like that. But, um, but yeah, he was legendary for that type of thing. Yeah, like I think he was on Taken to Pelham One, Two, Three, and yeah. you know, a lot of those movies. It's crazy to think those performances, how good they are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. It's like David Cohn throwing the no hitter. <laughs> yeah. Um, who who wants to start in on this? Aaron, you want to start? I can. I can certainly start. Do it. Um, so, uh, man, Chris, I love your interpretation. That was not necessarily the interpretation I had. What I tried to do was at least come up with something that that wasn't you know totally obvious. I wasn't always successful about that but the one that immediately came to me was Gattaca uh, with the uh, swim contest yeah. uh, that scene defines that movie and that's what it was for me I was mm -hmm. trying to think the scene you take out and all of a sudden the movie just doesn't feel the same it mm -hmm. doesn't have the same definition and that swim contest scene where I mean it's just got all those great lines in it just the idea of the whole theme of the movie rests on this idea that just because you're genetically enhanced doesn't mean you have the you know the drive uh and just that whole thing of i didn't save any for the swim back uh it's just remind me really, what this is so they're in the ocean and they're swimming out and they're just he's they're battling each other just like siblings and of course jude one law of them was you know created naturally uh, it's not jude law it's uh no it's, it's ethan hawk it's ethan hawk and his brother right uh and uh ethan hawk is the the normally created right parents had sex 
In a car. Yeah, in a car. <laughs> and his brother is the the genetically chosen one. Right, right, right. Uh and uh the whole the the whole swim sequence is like sperm going mm -hmm. towards an egg. Yeah. Uh that kind of metaphor and everything. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the, the the idea that we have that the fastest swimmer, the the fastest sperm that gets yeah. there first is the one that's really chosen. Not, you know, you didn't go into the middle of the bag there and find like, you know, that's mm -hmm. that's 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 the one i want you know <laughs> um but yeah you're absolutely right that scene totally so informs great. that movie yeah just that it's just the idea that we're just going to do this endurance contest and you know the key was i didn't care if i died you know yeah. and it's like that's it you there's something you don't account for when you just take talent or you know genetic ability into the equation uh there's there's the intangibles as they say in sports mm -hmm. uh, so yeah I that's can't remember favorite. who played his brother. I don't either. Do you know no. if it was somebody? I could look it up. I tell you what, that's an underrated movie. Oh, that, it's great. That we've been we've been pimping it pretty hard on Sincast, but people need to watch that movie. Well, and Andrew Nichol didn't really have the career I think a lot of people thought he would have after that. Other than what well, he wrote, Truman Show. Yeah, Truman right? Show yep. was the other one. And uh, he he tried to do that Simone yeah. uh, movie, but yeah, it was it seemed like his his biggest ideas ha happened in that mm -hmm. one little time period. That and Simone movie would kill today. It came out twenty years too soon. You think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. really think it would? Well, yeah, because this Will Smith uh, Gemini Man movie, yeah. one of the Will Smiths is an entirely CG creation. It looks they, like it. they didn't de age him. You think it looks? Like <laughs> I, I think it looks like it. They're, well, they're putting this movie out banking on most people thinking that's going to look real yeah. by the time they put it out and i think that's a much more believable environment for the movie simone than 2001 or whenever the fuck it came out yeah yeah because the cg was nowhere near us that was when we had the final <laughs> fantasy movie yeah. that didn't look real it looks like uh lauren dean that's what it says yeah, yeah. yeah uh, oh wow brother. from yeah. uh, say anything yeah he's in yeah. a lot of things yeah. apollo 13 is the one i always enemy think of the of. state yeah enemy of the state <laughs> and of course uma thurman Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doing great work. I just always too, remember so. say anything because of the, he's Joe, right? He's the one that Joe loves. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> when he cries. <Yeah. laughs> that was pretty much Jude Law's like start, wasn't it? Like, yeah, he wasn't pretty really much. Anybody. Like I had never seen him before, uh, and uh, at, but. He, he really made an impression because I remember going, who is that guy? Who yeah. is that guy? And then, yeah, he was in everything after Gattaca. Mm -hmm. He's so good in, in Gattaca. He's really good in the talented Mr. Ripley, but he's also playing like, uh, like a, like a version of himself, like hip rich playboy, like beautiful type of dude. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Gattaca, you could already see that he was able to stretch a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Johnny, okay. you want to go next? Yeah, we'll uh, sure. Uh, meet the Deedles. No, I'm just kidding. Hey. <laughs> no, this, I, I think I did this right. This The thing that popped in my head immediately was social network. Ooh. But this is right at the beginning because this is the breakup. Mm -hmm. oh, which, yeah. And the part of this is because I don't think when most people think about social network, this is necessarily the scene that pops up in their head. Maybe it is for some people. It's not for me. But that breakup is what, you know, at least in the movie, yeah. is what gets him to go for, basically go the route that takes him to where he gets to Facebook. Yeah, if you treat the movie on a, on a, as, as, as gospel, which obviously we can't, yeah. uh, then that is the, the impetus for everything that follows. It's the, the inciting creation incident, of Facebook. Yeah. And then even at the end of that fucking movie, he's still refreshing her goddamn page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she is that anchor point. Well, yeah, because in think. real life, he he married her, right? No, he oh. married somebody different. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and I don't even know if that girl was real. The, okay. the Rooney Mara. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know if that... I, it, <laughs> I guess I just assumed I, that I'm was... not even sure that girl was real, or maybe it was a, you know, based yeah. on somebody. I don't know. And that's such a great scene too, where she, you know, she's like, "I got to study," and he's like, "But you go to Boston University or whatever, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. or whatever it is." He said, "Yeah, yeah." It's even better than that too, right? Isn't it like Brown or something? Yeah, like, I can't no, remember. No, it's, it's BU. Oh, does he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, every time I watch that movie, I like that character less because you're you're rigged an initial rewatch be, or initial watch because of Sorkin's dialogue and everything, and because of how smart he is. To root for him, Eisenberg's character, not yeah, Rooney, Eisenberg. not Rooney Mara. Okay, well, yeah. yeah, you root for her character at all, you know, but uh, the the whole time. But like every rewatch, and like that last scene makes me feel so scuzzy, just like because he's cyber stalking yeah. this girl that, that 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 he fucked and not literally like he fucked over. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it. I agree. I like him less the more I watch the movie. That scene makes him more relatable to me. 
That scene makes him more human. Well, to we're me. all assholes. <laughs> we all want to be loved. That's mm-hmm, what. Yeah. That is the most base thing there, right? It's what she says. She says that line to him about "You're not an asshole. You just try so very hard to be." He just he he can't even convince her he's actually an asshole because she can see through that to see he's just a hurt little boy. Oh, see, I hate that line. I hate that line because it lets him off the hook in that movie. Maybe. Mm, maybe. It lets him off well, the hook. It's, it's saying that, no, you're not a bad guy. When everything he does in that movie is bad guy I would argue he, the real guy has done much worse in real life. Oh, uh, absolutely. Than anything a character does in the movie. Yes, uh, yes. But I just mean that last bit makes, it endears him to me more. It I makes, understand what you're saying. It makes me understand more how he fell to that place to yeah. where he could be so corrupted. But it's for such a great movie, though, it is bookended by a lot of ugliness. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is yeah, that is really interesting. Well, there's very few. I mean, Eduardo Saverin's really the the only guy to truly root. He's for the here. hero for sure. Sean Parker, you can't root for no. the Winklevoss twins are oh, dickheads. No. <laughs> um, I mean, everybody's shown to be out for themselves. Mm-hmm. Even the dean. I love that scene so much. Oh yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> I love that, but that scene dude's so a dick. much. <laughs> Oh my God! He but it's, he plays that so perfectly because it's such a generational out of yeah. touch. Because he's he's both right. The Winklevoss twins are wrong for pursuing it this way, yeah. and wrong when he says, "Have another idea." Have yeah. another idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that scene's so fantastic. Yeah. Well, that, this, he says something like, "What is he? He has to find out how they got the interview, and then or how they got the meeting, and then once he does, he's like, let me teach you something.' Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before that, he says the secretary's name, and he's like, "Punch me in the face. Go on." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that was my that was my initial thought was Rooney Mara and her uh, her, like her lack of boobs. No, you're you're right that, that uh, <laughs> he makes a comment about that. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. She calls her, her I, I forgot that was in the movie, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I thought you were just saying. No, 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 no. He calls he her flat Yeah, yeah. he calls her. He, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What, when she confronts yeah. him later on in the restaurant. I, she's like, "You were on the internet talking about my bra size." Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I have yeah. no negative views on Rooney Mara. Right, I don't either. Yes, it's a cold. I have no views on it whatsoever. <laughs> mm-hmm. I haven't. I haven't viewed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look at sports. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There you go. Uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, there's. Yeah. Um, a serious man uh, has Ooh. a scene. How many? Are, have you, have all of you seen? I've a serious seen it. Man? Okay. Yeah. Serious I saw man. it when it came out. Is this the Cohen? Cohen Brothers yeah. and Michael Stuhlbarg. Highly I always under, get this and the underrated. single man confused. Yeah, yeah. They came out the same year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you seen this? I love it. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's really one of my underrated. Uh, a serious man has a scene in it where he 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 talks to the rabbi, and the rabbi talks about the goy's teeth with engravings, mm-hmm. and uh, and so like Stuhlbarg's there to get you know to figure out answers he wants answers to life basically something that the rabbi he's been he's been searching for this the entire movie and the rabbi is like all right let me tell you the story about this this dentist who who uh worked on this goy's teeth and if you guys don't know what goy means it's non-jew um okay and uh and uh and so he did a plaster cast of this guy's teeth and he fi- finds the this these these words written in hebrew that says like help me or something like that mm-hmm. along that and he's like what does that what does that mean what is why does he have that on his teeth and all that and so like this guy is struggling to figure this dentist is trying to is struggling to figure out what is the meaning of this and he's he's losing sleep over it and he's he's uh he's uh researching and everything he's like what is this does it mean does it mean that i need to help more people do it does it and and finally i think it's a point i can't remember what point it is the rabbi tells the story and doesn't it doesn't have an ending to it Hmm. and he's like he's like uh he's like uh and you know and then uh you know he, he didn't know what the te- what it meant and uh that's the way it goes and michael so stuhlborg great. michael stuhlborg <laughs> is like he's like uh so what happened did, <laughs> did he find out who engraved the 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 markings on his teeth and the guy's like who cares <laughs> and he's, and he's, he's like isn't that why you were telling me the story <laughs> and he, and uh and he goes he goes he's like yeah you know these things are you know you don't have many answers to them or whatever and then uh there's a point too where he's like he's like i thought you were telling this the story so that you could give me answers and everything and the, the grandpa's like first i should tell the story and then i shouldn't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> and uh and uh then he's like well did, did he what happened after that and apparently like he he tried you know the dentist tried all sorts of things finally just gave up on it lived his life started sleeping better and that's the point of the story essentially Ah. 
uh, even though Michael Stuhlbarg is looking for a big answer, yeah. I, I think within the story itself, it tells you what you should. Mm, how no, you, it's incredible. How you should how you should react to some of these things. Some things are unknowable, and they are always going to be that way. And you shouldn't have to sit there and waste your life trying to figure it out because these things don't have meanings a lot of times. Hmm. It's it's the way I like to say it is we get so distracted by finding trying to find the answer that we forget the beauty of the questions. Yeah. And, you know, like there's this beautiful mystery about so many things. And this, this is what the movie is all about and yet we are so like i but i want to know why i want to know what i want to know why this happened and this happened it's like you just can't sometimes so Mm -hmm. this is the one where it was the book of job is kind of what it's correlated that's been tossed around as a as a parallel um i don't know if it's i don't know if it's completely that uh, well it is i mean it's very similar to job because god at the end of job is doesn't answer any questions he just says uh who are you and who am i yeah. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what I want to tell you. Like, I'm God, you know. You, I can't believe nobody's bitch. made a big budget. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> um, Job movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, the other thing that I hear about. You mean non tail Job, because the VeggieTales did. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the, there'll be some, you know, there'll be some uh, group from here from Nashville that makes a Job movie at oh, some yeah. point. Oh, yeah. And oh, it'll yeah. be like, uh, you know, you'll see the trailer and it'll look like all the other Christian movies that have come out and it'll be like group tickets on sale for this and all Kurt that. Kurt Cameron is yeah, the, Job. Yeah, the real question is, do they call it Job? Because everybody says Job yeah. when they when they see. <laughs> job 316. That's right. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be those guys that made that lawnmower movie. Oh, yeah. The lawnmower <laughs> movie. God, geez. That's a deep cut. <laughs> that would take a long time to, to discuss. Um, <laughs> they came to your theater. They though, right? did. They did. Yeah. I'm sorry. Long story short, there was an indie uh, a, a, an indie sorry. movie that came that came out to the first theater that I was at that nobody in the world has seen except me. And uh and couldn't uh, even tell you the title. Yeah, uh, like, I can't. Joe versus it's, Joe. It's Joe and Joe. Joe and Joe. There you go. Uh anyway, <laughs> uh yeah, that's that that is the thing about a serious man is there's all this stuff that happens in the movie where it doesn't have answers and even him, even Stuhlbarg himself at one point says this in a classroom when he's doing like a whole bunch of like equations or something on the board and he's like he's like and the point is no one can know what's going on <laughs> uh, i've never seen this movie i need to watch oh, this it's so I wish I once but it's, i really this like is it, right maybe. up your alley yeah. man this movie is so good is it, is it about him like like a like a like a meta existential type of exactly yeah journey about mm-hmm. trying to figure out it's things about, it's, still, it's hilarious yeah, it's, too yeah it's oh, really it's funny. so funny man Stuhlbarg Stuhlbarg is this uh guy he's married and he has kids and and uh and he's just got he's in all these different situations one of them is a student of his is lobbying to get an a on a paper that he clearly deserves an f on Hmm. and so like that's one crisis he has the others is his his kid is is about to do a bar mitzvah and he's kind of a fuck up and he's not learning all the stuff that he needs to learn Hmm. for his bar mitzvah and then his wife is leaving him for another man and this uh, this other man like wants to be friends with him (laughs) and so there's a there's a million oh and his brother his brother, played by Richard Kind, has a gambling problem. Ah, okay. So there's a million things going on in his life that, you know, are just all like little snippets and everything and told in that wonderful Coen Brothers way. He's, all right. he's basically having a midlife crisis and it's it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. My answer is is an obvious movie, The Godfather. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's an obvious scene. So you could pick out a million different scenes, including one deleted scene. Uh, where Michael and Vito have a moment before they go into the hospital room for the consig- consigliere, um, where he says, after this is over, come back and I've got work for you instead of going to, to college or whatever. How would you pick a del- deleted scene? That's in, that's in, I'm, my philosophy brain is... If the idea is you can't take the scene out or the movie changes, well, and it's that's in, not my but scene. The, but the deleted scene is already out. Is that's not my the, scene that I'm picking. Is it in the oh. one where they combine them? Yeah, though? it's in that the Godfather scene, saga. Yeah, it's in the Godfather saga. Yes. Okay. But the more I think about this movie, and I think about this movie a lot, is the entire plot and the entire ethos of the Godfather is predicated on the fight between Carlo and Connie. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. James Kahn knows that he's kind of like uh, that, that he's abusive to his sister, the 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 couple that gets married in the beginning of the iconic wedding scene. Um, 
And so Sonny knows that, that he hits her and stuff like that. And he's threatened him and he's beating the shit out of him and all that stuff. At one point when Connie is super pregnant and everything, she and Carlo get into it and Carlo starts beating the hell out of her. Yep. Luckily, most of this is off screen, uh, especially towards the end. Uh, but what happens is somebody calls, uh, in fact, uh, it's, uh, she goes over to Sonny's apartment and he sees her black eye, or maybe it's that he finds out some other way, but this informs everything. If Carlo doesn't do this, the entire rest of the plot doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Michael is already in Italy because he's killed the cop in, in Salazzo, but him doing this causes Sonny to lose his temper. Sonny goes over to the apartment, gets stopped at the toll booth, gets shot, gets killed. That predicates the meeting of the five families, which predicates Michael coming back from Italy, which basically sets everything into motion. Now, the interesting part about this is that uh, Vito sets up this meeting with the head of the five families and is somehow informed by this that it's Barzini. It's, it's not Tatalia that, that set up the hit that set up the hit on, on Sonny. You know, Tatalia is a pimp. You know, it never could have outfought Santino. It's Barzini. So Vito knows it's Barzini and tells Mike that it's Barzini. But there's something in Michael that isn't quite sure about it, right? Because he goes through this entire movie. They accept Carlo in after Vito. Well, actually, before Vito dies, when Michael becomes the Don, he makes Carlo his his consigliere and gets uh, uh, Robert Duvall out of there, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, what the hell is he doing? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. He plays this long con so that at the very end of the movie, he's killed everybody. Mm -hmm. He goes up to Carlo's house and says, you got to answer for Santino, Carlo. And he, he goes through this whole charade of like, you know, don't in insult my intelligence. I want to know who ordered the hit on Sonny. And finally, he says it was Barzini. And then he lets him go. For, for a little bit until he get he gets killed isn't that meeting is, is that the the meeting of the five families part is also the part where uh Vito tells uh michael whoever's not at the meeting is the one who was behind it is that no everybody was at the meeting it's it's uh, what he says is that whoever comes whoever sets the meeting uh to talk about making the peace and stuff like that that's the the traitor whoever comes to you and it turns out to be tessio uh, okay yeah, a yeah. Vigoda's character right and uh, it happens to be at Vito's funeral. He didn't mm -hmm. know that at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. But he comes to him. He says, that's going to be the traitor because he's been working for Barzini. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, this is the uh, the scene that you're bringing up is exactly what I, why I always bring up Godfather and why a lot of people bring up Godfather. But like uh, the the plotting of that movie is so in, is so good. And it's stuff like that. Like you can't take that out because that's what sets everything into motion that mm -hmm. whole thing it's a, it seems like such a small thing you don't even think about it when you're watching it mm -hmm. it's 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 a terrible scene that you think is just showing carlo being terrible mm -hmm. but then when you see you know michael you know, welcoming him in as the consigliere you're like i guess they're cool now yeah as an aside i think the movie sort of glosses over how the uh how they how you know, Vito sort of like allows this to happen, even though that's his daughter that's mm -hmm. getting beaten and everything. They sort of gloss over that. I believe in the book, uh, there's a point where Sonny goes to him and says, why are you letting this happen and everything? You and mom have a great relationship. I've never seen you hit mom. And he simply says, mom never gives me a reason to hit her. Mm. And that's how that, that conversation which, ends, which would be within character, right? Yeah, even yeah, though it's yeah. a shitty thing to say. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, there's, there's so many, the family dynamics themselves are complicated in this. And then you throw in the business dynamics and then you throw in the evil, uh, the, the gangster shit. And then you throw in the five families and then you throw in Vegas, you throw in all that shit. Michael doesn't go all the way out to, to Vegas. If this shit doesn't happen, he may still be in Italy mm -hmm. because if Sonny doesn't die, like that's when he calls that meeting. He's like, I'm a superstitious man. If my son comes back and is shot by the police or is struck by a bolt of lightning, I'm going to blame some people in this room. Yeah. <laughs> and all of that yeah. happens because Carlo beats up Connie. It's a weird thing to say, but I think that's the crux of the entire movie. Barrett is not doing an Italian accent, but he is moving his hands like an Italian. Hey, like. manja. <laughs> you can see him, man. Hey, what, what, He's got what, some what, what, wild what, what, hand I gestures I speak like uh, Italian like Kramer does at the uh, the Paisano's place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Hey, like kiss the counter yeah. and shit. Is that when he's like heating up his shirt? Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> they bake it at like 600 degrees. What am I, how am I supposed to cook a shirt? <laughs> I smell those cow salts. Costanza's yeah. in the building. <laughs> uh, do I get to do one even yes, though I had the Jaws example? Yeah, baby. Um, okay, I'm going to go Gone Baby Gone. Ooh. Um, a movie that listeners know I adore and have talked a lot about. And it ends with this moral quandary that I, to this day, think you could take either side and claim some measure of logic and correctness in making that choice. A, a, a little bit, probably have to spoil the movie. But basically, at the end, he has a choice to 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 take the law into his own hands, um, leave this little girl in what is clearly a better life, or do what the law says and call the police and have her return to her mother, who's a horrible human being. Mm-hmm. There's a scene about three-fourths of the way through the movie that I think informs everything, and it's when he gets a tip from his buddy at the bar about another previously kidnapped missing kid that may or may not be at this drug house. And they, he's even says they go immediately. He's like, you got your gun or your cheddar or whatever. They get in the car, they drive out there. It's pretty, pretty quiet ride. And they get out here. And basically you have two old people who are really, really into cocaine. Mm -hmm. Just give us a (laughs) whizza. Um, and then upstairs you have a, a pedophile and a dead kid. Um, and basically, through the course of this scene, Casey's character goes upstairs and finds the kid. It's a horrible, horrible, mm. hard to watch scene. And he goes into the next room and there's the killer. And he's saying something like, it wasn't my fault or we were just trying to have fun or whatever. And Casey takes about a second and a half and shoots that guy dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he goes outside and he gets the Ed Harris talk about the time he planted drugs on a suspect because he knew the guy was going to get away clean because of a corrupt legal system Mm -hmm. and he put that guy away and he'd do it again today if he had to even though it was technically against the rules i believe that scene is why casey's character makes the choice he makes at the end Mm -hmm. in the scene where he kills the pedophile guy he's taking the law into his own hands and not following the rules at Mm -hmm. the very end scene he has a chance to take it into his own hands and let the girl stay with morgan freeman but he's still so shell-shocked from what that did to him when he did take the law into his own hands. It crossed him over to a dark place, and I don't think he was ready to go back. You just blew my fucking mind. I I would never have thought that that was a primary reason why he made the decision that he made. I th- Because, I guess, so shooting the pedophile... <laughs> weird thing to say. Shooting the pedophile was the part that was out of character. Everything else that we've seen I believe so. is within character. I believe that was that was an act of impulse, and it was a morally... But I was, think you could argue it was a morally correct decision. Yeah, it was. And then the the thing that Ed Harris like, should have actually like confirmed that. And it did the opposite. Wow. I think. Well, wow. and his, his decision at the end, you could argue, is there's there's a you know it, it there's it's morally correct in some ways some ways it's not i think yeah if he'd yeah, rather I mean, stay with morgan a, freeman i think you could have made a case that was yeah. the right thing to do i love absolutely i, love story I like agree that. with that he decision. couldn't make he couldn't make that decision a second time have you couldn't. read have you read the book no i should well dennis lehane wrote it it's the fourth in i want to say a series of six novels and i don't i i don't remember exactly how the movie ends. i think it kind of just ends on that right um, no, yeah. he goes back to Amy Adams. Yeah, yeah, because she's, she's, she's Amy on, Ryan. Yeah, yeah she's right. got a date, and he's going to babysit. That's yeah, right, and she's just as shitty as she was before. She is, but that, but that decision. If you read like the one or two novels that come after it, like that decision has consequences, and I, I just I love stuff like that. Is I love, that they don't cheat with it? You know, they, is that character okay? So the, Dennis Lehane also wrote. He wrote Mystic River and he wrote uh, Shutter Island, but those are two separate. Those those don't have anything to do with this series. Didn't he write the one Affleck directed Live by the Night? 20s? Yeah, Live by Night? Yes. yes. Yeah, that was Lahane too. I yeah, just, yeah, that, so was, a, that, was, a, to know that was another thing that If, if any Mystic River characters are supposed to be characters from Mm-mm. Gone Baby, because they're both in Boston. Yeah, that's true, but to the best of my knowledge, there's yeah, not interesting. any. Because the Gone Baby Gone series, uh, he wrote those. Those were like the first books he wrote. I think he wrote Mystic River afterwards. Mm, okay. But I don't recall there being any crossover. But uh, it's they're great books. Let's check them out. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Whiplash. Mm. Uh, I don't think Whiplash uh, Whiplash from start to finish is one of my favorite movies grabs you the entire way but I think if you take out the rushing or dragging scene out of Whiplash mm. it completely falls apart I thought apart. you were about to do an ad on Whiplash <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you guys about Whiplash and, yeah uh, the rushing dragging scene can I oh ask you goodness. something about yeah. this before you before you say why 
had we seen this side of J.K. Simmons's character at any point before this scene? Um, I mean, if anybody else can I don't think, think of so. anything, I I can't think of anything. I mean, we've seen him be that very. I mean, even Stern, J. Jonah Jameson. This is the is, scene where he goes from demanding to almost evil. Well, what's beautiful about it is that it starts out like he's your best friend. Yes, he, he brings him in. He's like, "Hey, come on in," and then it's like, "Yeah, that wasn't quite right. Let's do it again." You know, and not and what you, my tempo. Yeah, my temp, my tempo. And what you know by the end of it is that was the plan all along. It didn't even matter what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He he brought somebody new in and he was going to break them. And it's just it's just I mean it's gaslighting in a lot of ways. It's uh it's brilliant acting in both ways. I mean Miles Teller is incredible in that scene too. So uh I just think without that scene, the end as spectacular as the end is doesn't have the the same amount of, you know, uh, rocket fuel to it no fuck no uh, no yeah. this is an absolute needed uh scene in the movie and it's so intense and so brutal yeah it's maybe 20 25 minutes in maybe even a little bit more before the whole time because he recruits him to the conservatory yeah and you see him being strict and stern with the band and very precise and everything and he's like all right you know why don't you get on the skins we you, you mm -hmm. do all that what i'm saying is that i really do not think you see any of this vile craziness beforehand. He he keeps it so under wraps. Mm -hmm. And then through, like you said, like through half of this scene, he's like, all right. And then we go, d d uh, not not quite my tempo. Right, you were rushing. Right. You were dragging. All that thing. And by the way, you go back and watch this. He is slightly. He's rushing when he says he's rushing. He's dragging when he says he's dragging. Yeah. So he's correct. And he throws that fucking chair at him or the stool or whatever. Uh -huh. And you're right. That The whole movie changes at that yeah. point. Yeah. Can you really, ignorance incoming, can you really get bloody fingers from drumming too much? I got some right now. Or I had a big blister right here that until wasn't a couple of days drumming. ago. From drumming? <laughs> yeah, from drumming. Yeah. Yeah. You play the drums? <laughs> yeah. He plays it. He's like Prince over here, man. He plays like 80 instruments. Hey, no, I told you I got a kit up in the in my house. And but I, like, bloody? Yeah. yeah. I played for about uh three hours yeah, straight I mean, you get blisters like you and weren't I, doing anything else and yeah, i got you'll the blister wear and i enough skin and i punctured it why you just wear gloves you look like a fucking <laughs> asshole you look like a slayer's drummer or something if you wear gloves uh is this is this scene before or after he tells his his the girl he's seeing that he's gotta he's gotta practice all the time and he's got to be good i think it's before yeah this is this is before so so it also informs that too yeah. of his life uh how his life's going to be at this point trying to impress the jk simmons character and everything and his the girl is melissa benoist mm -hmm. right supergirl mm -hmm. um and uh and uh that's another thing that happens from the scene it's so important it's so important to the whole thing because uh, he's not offended he's not insulted he should be he's motivated so J.K. Uh, Terrence, I uh, forget the, the guy's name, his character's name. Uh, he's, in a sense, right. When he does that whole scene where he's like, there's no two words worse in the English language than good job. Mm -hmm. Kind of well, right when it comes is, to this. This is the other thing about this movie. You talk about Gone Baby Gone. You talk about other moral quandaries. This movie doesn't necessarily come out and say he was awful and wrong for doing this. It says genius sometimes doesn't exist if somebody doesn't do something like this. I so, do believe the movie is saying that. I do mm -hmm. believe the movie is saying that he was he's a bad person with with harsh methods. Right, but if the result... But there's a result. There. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And it even shows the divergent path because one actually leads... We were supposed to believe that leads uh, one of his kids to commit suicide. Well, and then at the end, I swear to God, he's impressed. Right. Oh, like, yeah, he right? I, I, he's Absolutely proud of himself. Is. Finally, yes. I got out of you what I thought was in exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. The methods, how we got there don't matter. This is, and, and if you take that person's view of art and its importance in the world and the precision of that particular position, makes perfect sense. And that's why I'm saying it's the movie also is disturbing, more though. ambiguous than a lot of people give it credit for. I think for. that ending's oh, very yeah. disturbing. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it is. Oh yeah, and, and this is a, what we were talking about earlier before the podcast. Uh, become a patron if you want to hear more about this. Uh, that would have been a good example of a movie that I've watched once and will probably never watch again. Mm. What? As mm. much as I like, it. I don't like confrontation just in oh, general. Wow. <laughs> and that movie is like confrontation. The movie. Yes, it is. <laughs> I have never been more uncomfortable watching. It I've only. I'll admit. I've I only watch. seen it once oh, because yeah, I had two 
very demanding piano teachers when I was growing up. Uh, we were I had sense. two that were very awesome, and I had two that were very demanding dickheads. And it's hard. It's hard for me. We to went to <laughs> our high school. The band teacher got fired for uh, hitting a student. Yeah, Is that what like it was. That, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And my choir director was like that too. Mm. Uh, he's still there, though. He still is. <laughs> and uh, no, he, this is, he wasn't hitting people, as far know, as I know. Like Dazed and Confused is your perfect midnight movie or mm-hmm. whatever to put on anytime. This is my perfect. Like I'll put it on anytime. To go to sleep to to like anytime I come into it like I'm gonna watch the whole thing. I've I think I've seen it, it just five times and it's it's better every time. I, I, think, I think it's I think it's a very very good movie. I just it makes me uncomfortable. I just don't enjoy watching it. Like it's it, that moment <laughs> at the last scene where J.K. Simmons he he vacillates because because he you know he fucks the guy he fucks uh, Miles Teller in the first place and then he's so smug about it and he runs off and he comes back and then he starts playing the whiplash or the the boogie woogie whatever it is <laughs> and uh and and then you see J.K. Simmons like start to direct like he had this plan all along and all that stuff mm-hmm. and then he wanders over to to Miles Teller and he's like fuck <laughs> <me>. <laughs> and right at that moment Miles Teller splashes a symbol right in his face yeah. <laughs> and then he comes back and he starts smiling he's like yeah i got out of <laughs> so fucking good. love that movie yep um i originally had another coen, but since we already talked about the coen brothers i had another one um taxi driver yeah it's, and it mm-hmm. i think i'll be able to do it's been a minute since i've seen this but this one scene has always stuck with me and i i think it's a pretty pivotal moment but it's when he takes sybil shepherd to the porno mm-hmm. um <laughs> Which is still to this day like one of the saddest scenes I've ever seen. Yes, it is. <laughs> like because up to this point, even though clearly um, Robert De Niro's character, Travis Bickle, mm-hmm. clearly he's got some issues, he thinks he's doing the correct things. And when he and he takes her to this movie simply because it's basically the only theater he's ever been to. Yeah, he sees people enjoying the movies. Yeah, and so he thinks this is where he should he's take like, her. He's like, yeah. a lot of couples come here. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I like this, these movies. Like, this isn't so bad. <laughs> this isn't so bad. Yeah. <laughs> and Sybil Shepherd plays that scene so well because she just gets up, she walks out, and then you know, he goes out there and he's confused, and she's just like, "Why would you take me to that?" And, uh, you know, and like you said, he's just like, I thought that's what you were supposed to do, basically. And I think that's when a lot of things change. Um, he starts kind of realizing maybe he's not as normal as he should be or, or whatever you want to call it. And, not, and goes down a bad path. And not that. too long after that, there's yeah. that just awful scene where he's on the phone trying to talk to her. And yeah. the camera just kind of yeah. like moves away and just shows the hallway yeah. instead because oh, it's, it's horrible because it's so like you know because the camera is doing what we're doing it's it's almost like you know in john favreau and swingers yeah, when and i was just thinking when that. he's on the phone and he keeps calling the answering machine yeah. and everything, it's so uncomfortable because <laughs> it, it shows him the entire time but in taxi driver they're like this is so bad we we're gonna just go ahead and <laughs> give him privacy essentially <laughs> feel, but it's so sad because you feel like if she had just gone along I mean, not that she needed to go along with that but and i if the porno itself like they show part it's really disturbing yeah it's like, like a johnson and johnson documentary yeah. of some sort <laughs> but, um, johnson johnson, and yeah, johnson. Master and johnson. it's uh, uh, masters and johnson okay yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. i think that is a gay porn series johnson yeah, yeah. And johnson. No, it's a, it's a <laughs> mat- <laughs> It's a it's a Masters and Sh- yeah it is a gay porn series but we're not gonna get into that now. Barrett saw a whole movie on movie about it. Right? Um, was it into Jeff? Uh, <laughs> it's called into Jeff. Into Jeffchen. Um, the uh, but no the uh, Masters and Johnson thing is like a documentary and yeah. it was talking about like here are some studies but it's like orgies and yeah. all sorts of stuff on the yeah, screen and there's like they show like a knife cutting something. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's really disturbing. So it's one of those weird moments where like. If for some reason she's like, yeah, that was a fun date. He's probably fine, at least for a little while longer. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, that theater's but, fucking packed, I think, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of people in that theater. Well, it's I mean, Times so, Square. I, yeah. I would have loved to have seen Times mm-hmm. Square back in those days. That's the one thing yeah. great about watching New York movies in the 70s and even like early 80s is because it's so different. I think Big is when it's first like kind of looks more like it does now. I, I'll, I'll tell you just just as an aside – in Times Square, there's a there's a movie theater, the AMC Empire 25. It's the it apparently makes the most money of any theater in the entire world. Wow! Um, it makes so much money that Regal had no qualms about building a theater right across the street from it. 
a 13 screen and they have to share like big <laughs> movies that theater does tons of business yeah, man. that's yeah. how ridiculous Times square is <laughs> wow but they don't show the movies they show in taxi no 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 not anymore no but, but that's, that, that was mine and also a great movie if that's if you haven't seen it yeah mm-hmm. for Good sure mm-hmm. somehow of- somehow i can rewatch that but not not whiplash by the yeah. way it's fucked up. <laughs> list of shame i've never seen taxi driver yeah, yeah that is that's think, it is on I netflix think you right would now like it is it on netflix yes yeah. yeah. i'll check it out mm-hmm yeah. Oh, great, great score from uh, from uh, Bernard Herrmann, too. Yeah, yeah, no, it's I love his, la- his last one, his last score. Ooh. That's right. And a, a, a cameo from uh, Marty Scorsese. Yeah. And he and by the way, I don't know if we'll get to it. It's one of those great uh, directorial yes, yes. Uh, director cameos. Um, OK, so, yeah, I, I've got I wrote down some good ones. Bring <laughs> them, baby. Uh, we, we can list them even if we don't talk about all of them. Right. Like, yeah. Sure, or we yeah. Could, well, or we could do the topic again in the future. Ooh, yeah, we no could. Reason to burn through we content. Could. Uh, we could. Well, and I'm sure I can think of more. But uh, this could be a recurring segment Jeremy that comes and goes spoken. on the future show. Yeah. I agree. Let's not burn all of our answers. Uh, so I'm going to pick Reservoir Dogs: Ooh. The Bathroom Story. Ooh. Oh, perfect. That's perfect. Um, so I love how this starts off. This is this is uh, important mainly because this is how Tim Roth gets into this like gets the uh uh the trust of the the circle that he's trying to get into uh it starts off i love how this this scene is done because his handler guy is like it's like uh, gives him some pages and he's like what is this and he's like he's like that's a very interesting anecdote about a bathroom uh, about you going into a bathroom and the guy tells him you've got to know you've got to know everything about this bathroom you got to know what soap they use you got to know if somebody you know shat in the you know sh- splattered his diarrhea all over the walls you got to know blah 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 you got to know all these different details and he's like because you have to be a great actor you got to be like Marlon Brando in this and being a bullshit actor means that you're not going to succeed essentially so it starts off with that and then it goes on to him in his apartment and he's rehearsing the lines and they're very wooden at first you know he's just like <laughs> you know like yeah i don't know if you knew this but back in 1986 there was this big you know there was this big uh, shortage of marijuana and everybody was smoking their like wooden pipes and stuff and like uh and then it goes from that it, this is the whole scene it's not it doesn't repeat itself it's the whole story is being mm-hmm. told during this thing the next thing is him on like a stage with like all this graffiti and stuff and talking to it doing it in front of his handler and saying and continuing the story and then finally it shows him talking to mr white and Mm -hmm. and and uh, lawrence tierney and all these guys and it's like um i had to give this uh he's like he had to do the drug deal at a train station for some reason and uh he had to duck into a bathroom when he's in the bathroom there's four cops and a german shepherd yeah and then they cut to and it cuts to them in the bathroom now (laughs) what's important about that is now you realize he's officially gone from this is just some bullshit story to I lived it. Mm-hmm. I was there, even though it was just on pages at the point. And, uh, and him taught, you know, and it shows him not only saying what happened when he went in this bathroom and getting all the details of the soap and the dryer that he uses and everything. But he also gets the story of the cops that they are telling the guys like telling, <laughs> telling the, the cops are telling a story inside the thing. He's like, he's like, I tell this guy, he's like, put your hands on the dash or I'm going to blow you away. And he's like, I know, man, I know. And his hand keeps going towards the, to the, the glove box. And I was like, Mister, <laughs> I'm gonna blow you away if you don't <laughs> get your hands on that dash. And, uh, and like all these different things. And then there's that, that wind tunnel type scene where it's Tim Roth is just talking and the camera's like swirling around mm-hmm. and everything. And it's so good. It's such a centerpiece to the whole thing. This is how this guy got in and this is why he's as far in as he is. Yep. And so it's, uh, it's, it's not one of those. I, I don't know if it's a scene that if you take out it, the rest of the movie can't happen. It's not nearly as rich if you do. Right. Exactly. And that's why I picked it because if you don't know how he got in this, then you're just kind of going on his word. And I don't, I don't really like that. Like, Oh, he got into this like gangster squad of some sort without any, we need to know how he got in. Yeah. All right. I've got another, another nineties cultural touchstone. Goodwill Hunting. Yeah. 
Another movie that you could pick out a bunch of pivotal scenes, you know, obviously it's not your fault. And the, uh, the, 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 how you like them apples mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. shit like that. I wouldn't pick that. That'd be terrible. But my favorite scene, and I think the, the heart of everything really turns everything. You know how the breakthrough in therapy is where he tells the blowjob story, the coffee and the blowjob and the mm-hmm. stewardess runs up. And don't, Hey, uh, don't, don't forget the coffee. Um, and that's where they start talking for the first time. But all of this is very like surface level, very artificial. Uh, you know, the, before he gets to the point where he's like, you know, I want to talk about your wife and everything. There's one therapy session where he tells the game six story, the Pudge Fisk story. Yep. And it's done perfectly because it's set up to where they're just kind of talking. He's like, when did you know that he that she was the one? Uh, because he's getting really close with uh, with Minnie Driver at the time. And, you know, Sean, Robin Williams' character gives him the exact date. He's like, Jesus Christ, you know the fucking date. Mm-hmm. And he tells that whole, we're you know, going to game six. By the way, Robin Williams' uh, Boston accent is on fucking point mm. in this movie, which is weird. Mm-hmm. You don't think of him as a guy of accents, but he's, he's like a mimic, but he's not like an accent. Yeah, he, he, he would do the uh, the whole um, where you over-exaggerate mm-hmm. um, yeah. caricatures. Yeah, caricatures. Caricatures yeah, yeah, yeah. of well, an he's accent. acting against actual Bostonians. Yeah, Which he makes is. it even more impressive. Yeah, and, and he definitely yeah. holds his own there. You and know what the a, bitch of it is? It's paint by number. <laughs> it's paint by number. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he tells the whole story of like, you know, it, it's, it's beautifully shot and, and uh, divergent because... He's telling the story about meeting his wife, and then walks this girl, and he's like, it's a "Great game, though." You know, it goes to uh, yeah. Pisk, uh, homered in the ninth, and then the, it goes to extra innings, and then the twelfth. Now he's doing, and then it, it cuts back to footage from the thing and all that stuff, and he's actually like running around his table, like Pudge Fist running around the base, get out of here, and all that stuff. And you know, that's when Will's like, ah, "Did you rush the field?" And he's like, "No, nah, I didn't rush the field. I was in the fucking bar. I mean, having a drink with my wife," and that blows Will's fucking mind. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It yeah, takes it everything that he his world is built upon. What a great setup that he tells that whole story about, you know, Carlton Fisk hitting this home run. You forget and, about the entire point of the story. Yeah, yeah. He even tells as a this, viewer. Yeah, he tells this whole thing, and it's and it's punctuated by that whole like I can't believe you went to that game, and uh, and then saying oh, I wasn't there. Well, yeah, and and so it not only sets up. This is the crux. It's not the 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 blow job it's not when he strangles her it's not when, it's not when they do the taster's choice thing out of the boston commons or whatever it's this point in therapy where that's the fucking breakthrough because his world is shattered he's starting to fall in love he's starting to understand the impact that they have because he's like you know i don't regret the 20 years we were together or the three years that she was sick or the six months where she was really sick mm-hmm. and he's like holy shit this is like some real shit Obviously, it informs the last line of the uh, of dialogue in the movie too. The I had to go see about a girl, mm-hmm. well, son of a bitch, <laughs> stole my line, stole my line, which was improv. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read that. I read that. So yeah, uh, that's uh, you go back and you watch that scene. Now, I, I watched this. I've probably seen this movie about twenty times at this point, and every time this scene gets me, and the it's not your fault scene will make me fucking ball mm-hmm. like a baby. Mm-hmm. I always like the. I think you're right. I think that probably is the, the crux mm. where everything turns. I always like that scene, not the scene when Affleck shows up and Matt Damon's gone, which everyone seems to like. I like the scene when he tells him, you know, my my greatest dream is for sh- to show up one day and yep. ring your doorbell and you're gone. <laughs> That's yeah. not a threat. It's a promise. Yeah, uh, that that is m- more impactful than the scene when he shows up and no one's there. But I think that's I think you're on it there. Most oh, people man. would probably choose the it's not your fault. And that's certainly from a straight therapy perspective, that's probably the more important moment in his future mental health. But that can't happen at all without that other he moment. He doesn't get there you at have to, all. You have to break him down before you can build him back up. Yeah. It's it's an interestingly paced movie in terms of the therapy itself because there's several – it's re, it's re, very true to life. There's several breakthroughs. It's the, you know, easy chief, you know, strangle him type of thing. Then it's breaking his ass down when they're outside at the park and – then it's the the mandated thing where he's like out, you know, just staring at him basically and looking at the clock until yeah. he goes. And then there's this moment, and then there's you start to see real tangible, you know, do you do you write for do you uh, counsel veterans and that stuff, yeah. stuff that he wouldn't ask normally to anybody else. And then it's punctuated with the well, it's punctuated with the the fight that he overhears with uh, Sven uh, Stellan Skarsgård. Mm-hmm. Sven. <laughs> and uh and, scars and then that's right after that is the it's not your fault i thing. love that fight because both of them are truly in my opinion 
trying to argue for the kid's best interest. Yep. They just disagree what that what that is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like uh, yeah. Stone Skarsgård has a similar type of focus on his well being as J.K. Simmons in Whiplash. Yep. He's trying to get the most out of him because all that he's t- he's talking about the reason why he's where he is uh, is because he was pushed yep. and because of all these things. So like he's got an idea that if I push him and everything, but you know, it, you've got to understand that everybody's different mm-hmm. and like, yeah, there might be some other will hunting out there that likes to be pushed, but this isn't the one. No, he's not the one. <laughs> yeah. We didn't get enough of this kind of Robin Williams either. Like, when I mean, I miss that dude so much, but we never, I mean, I don't blame the guy for doing the movies that were making him money. I do not blame him, but he's well, so good in this. And movie. after this, it seemed like he was, they kept trying to put him in stuff like this. Well, yeah. What dreams may come. And, <laughs> yeah, was, Pat, yeah. was Patch Adams after this? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so there were, there were, there were attempts, but they weren't, they weren't made, you know, with that same kind of, Care. Yeah. Other random thought I had: if they made this movie now, uh, Ben Mendelsohn would totally play the Skeleton Scars Guard. Oh yeah, yeah oh for sure, God. for sure. Jesus, there's a, good. there's a random <laughs> there's a random scene in Good Will Hunting that I love, <laughs> where like I think I think uh, I think Will's in one of the other like it's one of the like failed therapist's office. Like uh-huh. it's not he's not with uh, he's not with Robin Williams Williams yet, and it's just a random scene. He's talking to this beautiful girl outside on a couch he's like you know uh a great uh a great proof is like uh, it's like a great poem to me <laughs> it's you know, a symphony <laughs> it's a symphony <laughs> yeah and and she's like wow <laughs> you know what he says after that he says it's like a symphony it's very erotic yeah it's very <laughs> erotic yes <laughs> And she's like, wow. <laughs> she's halfway between wow and, and like, like, get me get out, of out of here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. All right, guys, it's time to talk about Mubi again. Woo-hoo! And um, yeah, there's some really good stuff on there right now, including three documentaries from Errol Morris. Ooh, and yeah. uh, Errol Morris uh, has done some some great, great stuff. Uh, Thin Blue Line currently is on there. One of his all time best uh is on there right now you've seen this before right i've seen it twice i just saw this Mm -hmm. oh yeah it blew my mind yeah yeah it's a great documentary um uh you know uh the the one thing the one thing even though the, the the documentary is great it will depress you how how terrible politics are yeah yeah um and uh it's again it's another one of these where uh, someone is convicted wrongfully and for reasons that are just artificial. Yep. Um, you have, uh, you know, the, the, the circumstances in which this guy gets wrongfully convicted is, you know, oh, well, the guy who really did it was 16 and we didn't really, they didn't really want to put him through the, the trial because so he wouldn't be eligible for the death penalty. He wouldn't penalty. be eligible for the death penalty. And there's this prosecutor who's got a perfect record yep. and the judge basically goes along with it. And it's just like a, just a stack of things against you in this whole thing. And it's, it's stunning to listen to these people who think that they're right about the, the about getting this guy in the judge who's like yeah the the one jury gave me a nine to nothing uh, uh, ra- uh like uh agreed with me nine to nothing and then it went to the supreme court and it was one to eight the supreme court ruled against me but if you combine it it's 10 to eight <laughs> and it's like <laughs> and he says this with a straight face yep. which makes that uh by the way that documentary now thing yeah. that, that uh, the uh, the uh the was it the uh the eye doesn't lie uh yeah, t- yeah, yeah, episode yeah. even funnier because yeah. these guys are saying stuff that's completely ridiculous that could actually fit in yeah. the thin blue line yeah um and the way it's presented is genius yeah because you you don't it, it's like telling it like a cinematic story you get the facts almost in real time and you're like oh well maybe this did happen maybe this didn't happen and he presents it in a way with the reenactments and all that stuff that is very cinematic. Yeah, you get the Philip Glass score and oh, all yeah. that. Uh, it's great. I'm not sure if this was the first documentary to do like those reenactment type things. It feels like it is, just the it way does. they're staged. No, I think Rescue 911 beat him to that. Oh, Rescue 911, <laughs> damn. 
Do you I guys forgot that him. Show? Yeah. yeah, William yeah. Shatner. Uh, but uh, well, and unsolved mysteries too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the Thin Blue Line is great, and it's on movie right now. Yes, and it's mm. well worth the service. Just that movie. That alone is worth the zero dollars you would have to pay if you signed up at movie. Yeah. <laughs> com slash yeah. cinema. Set. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. What else is on there? Uh, you know, we, there's been so much crazy. I say crazy in in a good way, like um, stuff that will expand your horizons. I talked a little bit about, I talked a lot about exterminating angels last time. And there's other French cinema on there that's been blowing my mind. Jonathan, you're a Giallo fan, right? Yes. Uh, There's a Giallo movie on there uh, starring Vanessa Paradis, uh, who was Johnny Depp's, I think, common law wife or something like that for a while. Um, that's that's really interesting. It was directed by Jan Gonzalez. It's called Knife Plus Heart. Have you seen this? I haven't watched it yet. This is the one. It's on the set of a gay porn. Yes. Is that right? She's yeah, a gay porn yet. producer, yeah. uh, and she's gay, but in a different. <laughs> <laughs> what? Gay for pay. <laughs> Go on, Barrett. She's a gay porn producer, but she's also gay. It, like you know what I mean? She produces gay. Por- Anyway, it's it's disturbing and it's violent and I think it's very funny. There's there's a, a, a time where she's directing uh, like this 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 uh, trio of guys and she points out that one of them is not erect and she's like, take care of that, stay off the heroin. And he's like, no, it's not that. And then the the producer comes in and he's like, oh, golden mouth. And this dude comes in and he's like, what do you want? And he's like that guy. And he goes to- on it. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't sound funny until you started <laughs> laughing. It's, it's <laughs> anyway, it's it's uh, there's there's fun stuff, there's funny stuff, there's absurd stuff. The same guy uh, the the same director did a a short film called Islands which is also on the service right now uh that is very very fever dreamish. Anyway, you will have a ton of fun. You can watch something important like the Thin Blue Line, mm-hmm. and you can watch like you know stuff that's a little more ethereal, a little more. Are you doesn't take the porny stuff so. is not important. <laughs> it's because I take issue with that. It's an important in a different sort of there way. You go. Yes, yeah. So if you go to movie.com slash cinema sins, there's a ton of stuff on there. Just sign up, thirty days free. You got nothing to lose. You're gonna love it. Trust me. Uh, we love these guys. Uh, do it now. Do it yeah. now. And yesterday. Mm-hmm. You want to do some questions? Yeah. I oh. want the truth. Question. Question. I got something to say. I want the truth. I am listening. All right. Mm. We got everybody in here to answer some questions. Keep them coming. Uh, we've been trying to get through some of the backlog because you guys got some good ones. I'm not sure I've ever heard you guys talk about magnificent performances in animation. Voice acting is often overlooked by prestigious awards because you can't see them. But I feel like voice acting, in, in many cases, is harder than live action. My question for you is, what do you think are the best vocal performances in both movies and TV outside of the audiobook for The Able? <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and take the easy answer is Robin Williams from Aladdin. That is indeed the easy answer and mm-hmm. a very good one. Mm-hmm. Um, boy, he's all over the place. No, we were just talking about Robin Williams. Uh, we were just... Uh, and in TV, uh, this person picks Will Arnett and Bojack Horseman, who one episode is the only voice actor. Have you seen this episode? What? Where Will oh, Arnett? Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen them all. Is uh, delivering a eulogy, and apparently it's he's the only one. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great. A, that's a great episode. Yeah, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I should be watching the show, right? I should. Oh, yeah. Bojack. Yeah. For sure. Oh, for dude, sure. the internet says it is the most progressive show about mental health that has ever existed. You haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. But well, because yeah. of that, you and I both need yeah. to watch it's it. It's also very with it when it comes to Hollywood and movies and stuff like that. When I first watched it, I'll never forget watching the first three or four episodes. And this was around the time Cracked came here. And we oh, had yeah. our little co- collaboration with Cracked. And I remember talking to them and going, uh, yeah, the, some of the humor in this I'm not really not getting with yet. I think some of it's kind of cringe cringeworthy or whatever. And then... Right after they left, I watched the rest of the season, and I was like, "Man, this is great!" Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, I've gone back and I've watched <laughs> the other episodes too, and I'm like, "Okay, yeah, okay, I totally get what, what they were going for now." I and, t- uh, what, that happened to me when I watched The Sopranos for the first time. I didn't like the pilot, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Yeah, you know, come back." And then I came back and watched it again. I'm like, "What yeah, the fuck?" All man. the thing with the ducks and yeah, gra- yeah. yeah. 
Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to go with Justin Roiland and, uh, Rick and Morty. Ooh. He does both he does of Rick them, right? and Morty. Yeah, 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 he does. And, uh, and, and I don't, I don't know if that's how they record it. I'm sure at table reads, he's, he, he's doing Rick and then he goes into dude, he does Morty. And then like, <laughs> it's like uh, to do that, like to be the main guy and like basically 80% of the show and everything that is incredible. And he's, he does, he, he's just a naturally funny performer and everything. And especially, I, I'd like to know, I, I gotta come up with the name of the, of the episode that I think he is, uh, absolutely, it's, it's one of the last ones that played actually. That one where they're at the Citadel. It's the, uh, it's the one called the Rick Lantis mix up is the one that it's called. It's the seventh episode of season three, uh, where there's this place, the Citadel, where there's all these Ricks and, and their Mortys mm-hmm. and like just, just generally a population of Ricks and Mortys and everything. And it's got a huge social commentary during it the mm. entire time. It's like something that just comes out of nowhere, unexpected, but really funny too, while it's doing this social commentary and everything. But there's a, there's another, there's another Morty that's a cop that's in this, in this episode. And just the way he does his line readings and this whole thing is so funny. He's like, there's a point where there's like a murder and like the, the cop Morty goes over to two other Mortys and he's like, he's like, Oh yeah, I was, uh, I was just try- trying to look up, uh, trying to figure out who did this murder over here, but I don't know much because I'm a Morty. Oh, geez. <laughs> and, then, and, uh, and, and, and the the two the two the two Mortys are sitting there like spraying like doing graffiti on the on the wall and everything. And more the uh, the cop Morty ends up pushing and one of the Mortys up against the wall and he's like he's like huh you want to see how I paint a wall <laughs> that type of thing. They got a gun up to his head and everything. And like uh, uh, you know uh, it's uh, it's it's stuff like that. But uh, he. I think Royland just is uh, is is incredible. And I don't I know he's done a ton of other stuff before this. But like this is his masterpiece right here for sure. Um, so yeah, I would I would pick him there. I'd also say Harry Shearer does the same kind of work with mm-hmm. uh, with Burns and Smithers. God, he is and and a million other characters yeah. to come he, and go too, right? Yeah, for sure. He's got such a beautiful, sonorous yeah. Voice. He does all the like the Vin Scully, yeah, and he does yeah. all the he does the Kent mm-hmm. Brockman and yeah. all that. While well, we're throwing shout outs to uh, like the supreme voiceover gods um futurama uh, billy west just blows yes. my mind yes um, so who does he is, is he's he play fry the... he's oh, philip okay. fry he's also zoidberg yeah. and also professor farnsworth Ooh. And, uh, <laughs> and he was ren and stimpy when uh john yeah. when yeah. john crick felusi had to was forced from the show yeah really yeah he's wow. also the honey nut cheerios b yeah so yeah. you know the, I've, I, I uh i heard uh i think it was Marin who interviewed him and uh yeah i heard that interview yeah That's and he stuff. was talking about like uh how he got into the voice acting and everything and it, apparently it was some sort of contest to do mel blanc's uh like voices or something like that huh. and he did it really well and that sort of like built his momentum over the years hmm. and and everything that was a really interesting listen uh, uh as far as movies are concerned i'm i'm gonna pick an uh, i guess an obscure one but it's darren norris who plays spotswood in team america uh, <laughs> oh, who, that's awesome. you know, who, who, you know, he's he's the guy who set who, who talks like this all the way to, it's like he's like you he's like he's, i do not want to fuck your mouth and my time is very valuable you know that type of thing. <laughs> Does he give him a blowjob? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. He does it. Oh yeah, because he's okay. like, "Wow, you really are committed." <laughs> <laughs> I was actually looking for something. <laughs> I was looking for something for an outtake the other day, and I I came across the everyone has AIDS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which I had completely forgotten existed. Yeah. And my favorite bit in that, which he's in the audience in that part, yeah. right? Because that's where that's he's, how he finds him. But uh, my favorite. We've, we've got a lot of quilting to do yeah 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 yeah, yeah. oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know oh, why that makes so me great. laugh so much <laughs> yeah so we all had aids he died of AIDS. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah there you go uh you know there's two ways to go with this i we kind of honor the people that are just incredible with their voices but the other way to go with this is just great casting mm-hmm. and i mean you could call that the pixar award because they've always been incredible at finding the exact right people for the exact voices yeah uh Finding Nemo throughout is that way. Uh, Albert Brooks and Ellen DeGeneres are just perfect mm-hmm. in those roles. Uh, the entire cast of Inside Out, 
uh, for all those different emotions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just, you know, Amy Poehler and Mindy Kaling. Yeah. It's just, it's perfect all the way down. You know, Louis Black, I think, plays anger. I wish and, Bill Hader had a little more to deal with for his character, you know? Yeah. He's not, because he's anxiety, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Or, no, fear. I think fear, fear technically. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Yeah. Louis yeah. Black is, is, yeah, everybody in like Phyllis, uh, whatever her name is, is mm-hmm. the. The depression and all that. Yeah, from the um, office. Everybody thinks yeah. they're going to do a sequel, so maybe he'll be, maybe he'll get more to do in the sequel. I don't want a sequel. <laughs> I do just you want know a sequel that's, for that's, the, that's their that's like their big property. They've never done a sequel to. That's why a lot of people have that. Theory. But if they, I know nothing. If they do it, I, I don't know. I guess they could they could go it, through her puberty yeah. years or whatever. But I would almost want there to be somebody, some new. Yeah, person. and it's going to be can. like eight years if they do it because they've got like the next seven or eight planned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's perfect the way. It who is. did Nemo? Who directed? So, it? No, who Some did? Kid. Who did? The wasn't it? Of wasn't Nemo? it Eli oh. Marienthal? I don't, I don't know. know. The guy, the kid who was in American no, it's, Pie. It's Alex. Oh. Some. It's Alex something. I think. Lifeson. Um, <laughs> Lifeson. I don't think it's anybody that's done anything. Winter. Ever. Sorry. I just I I have this beautiful Nemo poster that's signed Alexander by him. Gold. Yeah. Uh, oh, that sounds right. So, I don't know. I just hmm. thought that throw that. I thought maybe I think you would Elliot's know. boy. E- Eli, Mar- <laughs> e- Eli Mary. If only there was a website. Yeah. Oh, Eli Mar- e- Eli Marienthal did the Iron Giant kid. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Who is he in American Pie? He's the brother of Stifler. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And then I also always think of uh, Billy Crystal and John Goodman and Monsters Inc. are just perfect for those roles. And you love that movie, right? Monsters I, Inc. That's yeah. my favorite yeah. Pixar movie. That's your favorite Pixar. Mm-hmm. I'm missing something. I, th- I saw that movie once. And I, 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 Kitty, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boo, Boo is so precious, <laughs> and it's just, it's it, really it, hard. Do you love this movie? No, I like it. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. But, but there I are don't... people, more people like you guys that adore it. Right? There are. I'm not one of those. Yeah. But I don't have any hate for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, and then I had to give a shout out to Jim Cummings, uh, Winnie mm-hmm. the Pooh, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. other voices that he for does. For sure. Who was the um, other character, like the the iconic character that he played? Well, he also does Tigger, right? Like he does yeah. Tigger and Pooh and uh, and uh, Paddington, right? No, who you made somebody made a sin referencing Jim Cumming in he did the voice of Paddington and Pooh, didn't pa- he? He did Paddington too, right? No, no, Paddington is um oh what's that guy's name? Oh, it's the it's uh he's uh whip the new Q. He ben Whishaw. Yes, yeah, thank yes. You. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. The guy from Mary Poppins Returns. Oh, yeah. the guy from Cloud Atlas. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're just yeah. Out of yeah. Everybody has a Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, it's like uh, in uh, Swimming with Sharks where Frank Whaley's trying to tell his buddies who Shelley Winters is. Oh, yeah. And then goes through all the place in the sun and all this stuff and then finally goes, the Poseidon adventure. And they're like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he is known for voicing the title character from Darkwing Duck. Ooh. Dr. Robotnik from Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, I've seen that uh, way too Winnie much. The stuff. Oh, and the Tasmanian Devil, apparently. Oh, man. Can you imagine how much fun that would be to go into a vocal yeah. booth and do the fucking Tasmanian Devil for like an hour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Alan T- Tudyk doing the, the <laughs> chicken. <laughs> ch- ch- chuck, chuck, duck, duck. Uh, hey, hey, chicken hey, hey. in Moana. Oh, I know, the, I know the scene you're referencing. It was uh, in Princess and the Frog because he did the, the Firefly. Oh, he that's right. He did the Cajun yeah, that's Firefly. Right. That's right. Jim Cummings yeah. did Would that. Would you say Jim Cummings' uh, Winnie the Pooh work was best in Christopher Robin over all the other ones that he's done? Oh, I, it's just so There's I don't something know, about so it. There's something, I don't know if it's because it's the live action or what, but uh, there's something very touching about Pooh in that movie, even though the movie yeah. itself I'm not a huge fan of, but like, I mean, like, I mean, I like it, but it's... Uh, but like, there's something about the expressions and the acting in that that just are are really good. Like, mm. you really get drawn in to Winnie the Pooh in that movie. Yeah, maybe that it's live action. Maybe that it brings it more into more like an a almost like an adult environment because it's not just live action. It's also dealing with you know Christopher Robin's all grown up too. Mm. So there's kind of a deeper aspect to those funny little pithy things that Pooh says take on a different texture. Yeah, you know, to them in in some ways. So yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I always liked Ed Asner on Freakazoid. <clears throat> mm. Now, he's basically playing Ed Asner. Um, he plays Sh- Sergeant Cosgrove. He's the police officer that works with Freakazoid. Oh, solving yeah. Solving cases. And yeah. he's basically just a crusty old foil for all the weird shit Freakazoid does and says. Uh, but I always admired how much he went for it. Like, 
Now, just scrolling through a second ago, looking at his IMDb, he has done a shit ton of voice work. He's got a great uh, voice. What, He's, did, what did this play on? I never saw this show. Oh, it was uh, whatever the, wherever they played Animaniacs. Oh, yeah? It's, it's the like same, WB, yeah, something like that? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it was Spielberg produced, Freak is Oh, okay. Um, and it's about a kid who goes into the internet. That's his superpower. Mm -hmm. He can move really fast, but can he? Because usually he's just running with his arms up going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that show. It died too soon. But Ed Asner was always funny on that. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and say James Woods, even though in general on Twitter today, I'm not a big fan of the man. Or what I agree he has with to you say. on this, by the but way. But him as Hades mm -hmm. in the Disney Hercules is one of the finest pieces of voice work. I think it's almost as good as Robin Williams. I mean, it's almost as manic as Robin Williams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 comical yet still menacing. It's I mean, he was probably the right guy for it. Mm -hmm. um, he probably wouldn't get cast by Disney today. No, um, but I'm sure he I, got into the role. <laughs> yes, he may have gotten into the role. Um, <laughs> gestures not described by voice. Um, but those are my answers. And that was a great movie. That is one of those in that prime of Disney that never gets talked about. People forgot the shit out of that movie. I think more people talk about Tarzan than they do was Hercules. Was that Brad Pitt that was Hercules? No, um, no, it was Tate Donovan. Oh, um, that's right. Believe it or not, I just pulled that out of nice. my ass. Nice not the, I didn't say that guy who dated Rachel on uh, five episodes of Friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <I> well, <laughs> and, and was actually engaged to be married to he Jennifer was. Actually, they filmed those scenes on Friends after they broke up. No way! They, oh, they shit. booked it before they broke up, and then they broke up, and he came on and oh, still did the role. Had to, That's a pro's pro right that there. Had to have I, feel like, I feel like he dated Sandra Bullock, he too. He did. After, after, after Love Potion nine. number nine. Yeah. God, Tate Donovan, I think, dated everybody back then. Like, there's some, there's always a connection to him for some reason. <laughs> he was um, blonde. So, and, I mean, no, he's a good-looking dude. Yeah. I agree. I think Hercules is overlooked and not talked about enough. And, for sure. Uh, maybe not for Bobcat Goldthwait. <laughs> maybe not for Danny DeVito. The songs are really charming. Yeah, they they are. have the, mm -hmm. They have those, those girls on the vases who are like a gospel choir there's two or three different songs that are almost expositional but they're dancing across the pottery singing it to you fantastic mm -hmm. by the way i feel like that's something else disney has gotten away from i since toy story i feel like they really have been trying to get big name actors on these things mm -hmm. ev like in everything but when you look at some of their even stuff in the 90s there's there's like normal like yeah. everyday character actors playing so well, yes. they weren't they character were, based. in fact it was it would be one right you would have robin williams yeah. in aladdin and all the rest of the voices are people you've basically never right. heard of um all the way even including jafar mm -hmm. um and then they just started doing it for everybody there was even a weird thing though back in toy story i don't rem i don't know what the story was about this <laughs> oh. um but uh they couldn't even i don't think they could in trailers say that it was tom hanks or something like there was some there was some movies they came out with i don't know if toy story was one of them but there were some movies they couldn't tell what they couldn't say what the who the voice actors were Interesting. And that, that changed somewhere in the next five years obviously because now like they have to give you everybody who's well and now that's how they market now i'm not talking about pixar and your upper tier animated movies but like the Imagination Studio. What's the name of the studios? Uh, Illumination. Illumination. Those kind of movies. Uh, the Trolls. Dream. The yeah, big, DreamWorks. The, the Bigfoot. They actually market these movies with the voice cast. Mm -hmm. The trailer will say, starring the voices and they'll, of... And they'll cut to them in the, in the studio, A picture too. of them in yeah, studio yeah. talking. That doesn't move the needle. No. Why do they think it does? I well, don't in know. fact, it can make things worse. It because does. Because it's distracting. You're picturing somebody in a studio yeah. instead of actually well, the Well, in character Inside in Out, if they market Inside Out that way, it's going to be that one girl from The Office that you don't know her name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, but it's still perfect. And right. it didn't keep anybody from going to that movie yeah. that, that it wasn't. And some three-year-old kid's not going to give a shit that Channing Tatum is voicing Bigfoot or whatever. Well, or whatever. and I'd say the same for Frozen. I don't think yeah. Kristen... Bell. Bell and... The... Adina Menzel. <laughs> the other girl. No, the other Adele sister. Uh, oh, who 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 vo voiced it's, Anna? Isn't it a famous... Kristen no. Bell. It was Kristen, Kristen Bell, Bell and Adina Menzel. Adina Menzel. I thought it was somebody else in there. Anyway, it doesn't need to be them. Frozen would have been a big hit without Kristen Bell in there. Yep. They do a good job, but I yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm just saying. Who voices Sven? Do you know that? Who voices the moose? Sven is uh, Josh Gad, right? The, no, Sven. No. Josh Gad is the... Oh, Sven, Sven is the, the the reindeer, right? The man, the guy, the guy. It's probably Vin Diesel. It looks like Owen Wilson. <laughs> the guy that talks to the, the donkey, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reindeer. Yeah. 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 Well, we're off topic. Jonathan? H. John Benjamin, Archer. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> yep. And he's obviously done a lot, too. I mean, people could say Bob's Burgers. He was uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Katz. Dr. Katz. Was that his 
one of his first. I it guess? Was, he was he, he was, was the Doctor Cut's son. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Wet hot uh, American summer man. Yep. There you go. <laughs> but uh, but Archer. God, that's funny. And this does this come out Monday? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the TV sends for Archer will be out. So we just watched rewatched the pilot. So and, good. Oh my god. That I I still like. I'm just gonna use that uh, Johnny Bench call. That's gonna be like just a random line I say for the rest. of I my had life. to look that up. I had no <laughs> idea what they were what they were what he's talking about. So what reference to the looseness of a catcher's mitt. <laughs> yeah, there was. What? Yeah, well the thing. Yeah, there's a he go he walks in on his mom masturbating uh-huh. and he's he, of course he's grossed out, but he, he's Archer. So there's also some weird like other things going on too. But uh, but. Uh, he he as he leaves the he leaves the room he was like and oh johnny bench called and and that's how it ends and then he brings it up later he brings it up later but then i was sitting there going what does johnny bench have to do with us <laughs> like the, i couldn't even get the catcher's yeah. mitt part of it <laughs> it's the way he says the line and i just i love characters that are just asinine and ridiculous like that but he's also really smart, mm-hmm. and he's really good at what he does. Yeah. And, I mean, H. John Benjamin, I mean, gets all that in the performance. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's an amazing. He's got such a great voice. And he's got such a great voice for that, too. And, um, I mean, it, it, it looks the exact opposite. Yeah, what a, f- a voice-face <laughs> mismatch, man. Because a lot of those people look the exact same. Like, that yeah. kind of looks like, uh, not Chris Kattan. Chris uh, Parnell. Chris Parnell. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, they all kind of look similar to their characters. And uh, But he is the opposite. But he's he's so awesome. And I thought that show kind of got off the rails. I think you said you actually started liking it better. When they I'm got still out of watching the it. Yeah. Um, I, I I liked it better when it just decided just to be abstract. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last few seasons, they've just done themes. Yeah. So now the whole cast is back in the 40s or yeah. now they're in space or, yeah. you know, so. And I think that freed up the writers just to be, you know, as ridiculous what, as one, they wanted to be. One thing I thought was hilarious is kind of getting off topic of H. John Benjamin, but the character of Pam, when they did the whole season where they were on the run, I guess that was like the Burt Reynolds season. Yeah. And uh, she was constantly doing cocaine. Mm-hmm. Yes. And she got like way thinner. Yeah. <laughs> Just like per ep- like from each uh-huh. episode. Yep. That was hilarious. And more <laughs> more attractive to Archer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, but yeah. The, but I think they still never like hooked up or anything. No, they did. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah, never mind. I'm pretty sure they did. Maybe um, they did. But uh, but he's great. But um, uh, what was the was the last one? Was that the Danger Island one? Was that the Danger Island was last season? This season is uh, space, right? Yeah, but they're calling it like 1987 or so. it's weird it's like from the past but it's a sci-fi future kind of thing yeah i, I stopped about halfway through the miami vice one and then i guess danger island was the one after that i, did I not think so yeah. Da- the, yeah well there was also one where it was a big murder mystery thing that happened saw that. somewhere I in the middle that of that one. yeah uh but the 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 danger island one was one where i had a hard time getting through episodes yeah. uh because it, it, i don't know if it was because i missed something or whatever but i was sitting there going man this is just not it's not appealing to me and i was losing the track of the plot that was going on i'll have to go back and watch it but you but, know uh, i just think the writers on that show are just geniuses mm-hmm. yeah they're just so clever oh it's, yeah yeah and it, yeah and it's just it's I, it's just my kind of sense of humor i i like the i like the johnny bench call i like the really subtle stuff that mm-hmm. like you know not necessarily you have to think about but i just like the it's like it they they do a great job of they'll just it'll just pause and they'll just be silence and then he'll just say something like that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you're just you know, you're just rolling. And like they even had this stuff like I forgot about like in the first season, maybe even the first couple seasons, he kept accidentally shooting that guy in the office. Mm-hmm. I mean, they would just do great running jokes like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, but as far as movies, uh, Jeremy Irons is Scar. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Scar is probably and I have not seen the uh, the new one, but uh Thank God my my daughter actually went to a sleepover where they went and saw it. So now I don't have to see it. Nice. <laughs> but uh, Scar's Score. probably my favorite villain from a Disney mm-hmm. animated movie. Um, and then I thought Charles Fleischer and Kathleen Turner were worth bringing up for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Ooh. In Ooh. fact, Charles Fleischer, he's so like, that's all I can think of that like that scene in Zodiac where he's he plays like that super creep they go to his house they think i mm-hmm. think they end up thinking he might be yeah, the killer, yeah 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 and he's just kind of in the shadows and stuff that scene always weirds me out because i'm always like that's roger rabbit yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like did roger rabbit rape and kill a bunch of women but and then kathleen turner obviously is amazing in that movie mm-hmm. so uh i know you guys aren't as big a fan as i am but uh but the voice works good seth I, seth mcfarland's probably worth bringing up too right yeah and patrick warburton yeah 
Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Mm. I mean, I don't, I don't particularly <laughs> like Family Guy, but McFarlane's a very. Oh my talented... God, Joe! You were so good last night. <laughs> I know. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a uh, he's a very talented guy. So, and uh, everyone should watch the Orville, but that's not animated. Yeah. Yep. Uh, all of the fantastic Mr. Fox voice cast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. George Clooney and Bill Murray in particular. Willem Bill Murray. Dafoe. Willem Dafoe is great. Bill Murray in in a limited role, I guess, in that. Has just such a perfect fox for what it, he's a skunk. He's a uh, he's a weasel. He's a weasel. Or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. He's got a perfect rodent b- voice. Like I don't know. It just, I mean, it it's works no perfect. Garfield, but <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. <laughs> no, he does have. It's like H. John Benjamin. He has a singular voice. Yeah, yeah. it'd be nice to see him do more animation. Heard the story about that. Bill Murray doing that Garfield movie. Right? Yeah, what he didn't he, he didn't realize what it was. No, or something? he he the the. Uh, there's a guy named Joel H. Cohen mm. oh, with an H. That's right. Or something like that. And uh and he thought it was a Cohen brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh gotta shout out Holly Hunter in The Incredibles. I think she's even better in Incredibles two than she was in Incredibles mm-hmm. one. She's so good. Uh I want to marry her and have babies with her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I especially love the way she talks to uh Mr. Incredible on the phone in the first one. Where she's like, I got all the boxes packed up, ha ha ha, or whatever, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or something like that. I uh, got a Trey Parker and Matt Stone are perfect, even especially in the movie, but also in the the South Park TV show. Hmm. And I love me some Peter O'Toole in Ratatouille. He just yeah, saves yeah. Actually, good one. every line. That's the best response you gave. Actually, yes. I agree with that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, you're all all your responses were good, but that one when I saw you wrote that one down, I was bummed because that would have been one of my picks. He has so little screen time, but he makes he has such a commanding presence over the whole thing. Yeah, I love Peter O'Toole, man. I think Patton Oswalt's great in Ratatouille. Oh, he was he fantastic. Is. He was the bomb in Phantoms. He was a bomb. In <laughs> nice. Well done. Uh, he was awesome in King maybe Ralph. Maybe that'll too. be in yeah. the maybe that'll be in the reboot. Oh <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we're gonna do a, a little mini review inside of this uh, inside Woo-hoo! of the big podcast of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, uh, I saw this uh, this past Friday uh, uh, in the thirty five millimeter format. Ooh. Can I ask you real quick? Me does as that, well. I th- we may have talked about this before. Does that make a difference to you personally? No. Yeah. Yeah. We I, had this I, conversation. I'm 100 percent with you. Me too. I I, 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 didn't I worked in projection for years. Dealt with 35 millimeter forever, and I just don't see the difference. The the the, the digital like the thing about 35 is is that uh, I noticed when the reels were changing. Mm, yeah. I noticed I noticed when they had the lab splices still in and everything, and there were about six of them in this movie. And I was just, you know, and it's, and it makes me more aware of the, the, you know, what's, what I'm watching. Okay. Uh, it was a very clean print. It mm-hmm. may not be that way four or five weeks from yeah. now, mm-hmm. uh, which is the main, the main thing. I don't know why, like you would think that I'm a huge 35 millimeter apologist, but no, not really. There's a whole, it, similar in the world of music audio, there's a whole movement of people that think two inch tape is is the only way to go reel to reel Mm -hmm. to get a warmth Mm. that digital recording removes and i've heard the same kind of arguments made about 35 millimeter versus digital and i'm with you man i just Just i don't don't see it i don't when i watch a print and sometimes you'll even come across like an airing of something on tv or a dvd that's been made from a scratched up 35 millimeter print <laughs> or what have you i see noise yeah. and, and when i watch something digitally projected i don't see the noise yeah. and if you want to make the argument that the noise nostalgically takes you back to when you fell in love with movies that is all good by me i don't I feel the exact same way with vinyl versus digital yeah. okay yeah. well and and by the way the project the last project green light that that happened on hbo <laughs> there was the guy that they picked Sorry. was absolutely adamant that he had to have film oh, i remember this and they kept telling him dude this is too much money for what you're trying to do and besides here it is side by side you tell me what the difference is and he still was like no 35 is the way to go and then he even got he even got what he wanted he did 
and uh, and the and he was just not even thankful about it. This and is it, the season with the poor put upon producer yeah, who yes. had to deal with all the shit. Yes. And yeah. if there was ever a movie that it didn't fucking matter if right. it was on film or not, it was that fucking that movie. movie. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is uh, Tarantino's ninth. Yes, it is. Uh, That's nine, counting Kill Bill as one, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, Which is uh, some bullshit. I he, don't care. Well, he did make that as one movie at well, first. And it's more the Weinsteins that cut it up into two. Oh, okay. I, I, I won't argue that. Um, but uh, but I yeah. think the, the only reason we're counting is because a long time ago he said he was going to make exactly. ten and be done. Yeah. And so to combine them here feels like just an excuse to make one extra movie. I don't yeah. believe he's going to be done anyways. But He's going to finish with Star Trek. That's going to be his last. I don't, I don't, I don't know. We'll <laughs> see. Uh, but this is, when you make a, when you, when you title something like this you are aiming for once upon a time in the west and these these movies that are generally considered all timers right so that when you come out with a movie called once upon a time you're going for it right yeah and he's uh, also tipping his hand as he does in inglorious bastards which opens with the text title of once upon a time in nazi occupied france mm-hmm. yep that it's a fairy tale yeah um, yeah, I was gonna say it plays on both of those angles because it it very much owns a lot of a part of portion of the movie owns, owes a lot to Sergio Leone mm. and the type. Yeah, yeah, uh, but you got to know that when you get into these, you get into a Tarantino movie, it's a different world mm-hmm. and everything. But it's a it's 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 a story of of DiCaprio, who's this uh, semi struggling actor from TV who does a lot of westerns uh, and stuff like that. And then, and you're talking about Sergio Leone and everything and how. The parallels to Clint Eastwood are in oh, yeah. are in this because Eastwood famously had a had a career that was tumbling and wasn't going he wasn't going anywhere and he ended up doing the Sergio Leone movies and that's what became he became a huge star. Uh, but um, anyway, DiCaprio and Pitt, who plays his uh, his uh, his stuntman, and uh, it's a it's about them and it's a parallel time to. Uh, the 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 manson family and everything so we also meet sharon tate played by margot robbie uh so this is a parallel thing going on at, at, you know they're going on at the same time uh but the movie's not really about the manson family nope and i know that's how it was sort of pitched when you first heard about it probably just it gives you a frame of reference of when this is happening and everything reminded me a lot of summer of sam yeah Spike summer Lee of sam movie. exactly yeah it's a that's a good that's a good uh parallel for sure uh, but we get to see DiCaprio, him trying to make it in, you know, he's, he's had his semi success on TV. He's, he's looking f- to be uh, a bigger star and have a bigger career and everything, but he's having to play villains now where he was the hero mm. before. And, uh, I found the, the, uh, that, uh, fascinating about him. This is sort of a character study in a way about him uh trying to trying to make it and everything mm-hmm. and then pitt's got his own little things too and he's funny in it as he's well. outstanding in this movie yeah he's it, my favorite part well, of this it's movie. one of the things that you think that you think about when you think about brad pitt and it's like man this guy has been in he's like been in he's had a lot of great performances we mm-hmm. don't really we don't really give him that credit do we he's all nope. he's he's uh, he's always been like the the good looking guy who's uh who's at least uh professional enough to to knock it out of the park every once in a while but you think about 12 monkeys and you think about oceans uh, 11 oceans 11 glorious bastards uh you know he's he's good yes he is uh so uh and uh so it's just uh it's it's a uh, what um i've i've heard uh uh many times it's a love letter to hollywood right mm-hmm. so it's a uh, it's 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 uh it's a uh, a time that you don't see very many movies about movies being made you don't see a lot of the stuff with late 60s and everything mm. most of the time if you're making a movie about making movies it's about present day or it's about the the golden age and everything so you don't really see this is a really interesting time for movies too because this is when it's like going from the the you know it's going from the innocent you know whatever like you couldn't show very much to the mpaa being created and everything uh but uh yeah uh i uh i without going further into the plot and everything i really like this this is this is one of my i mean it's i it's not tarantino has such a great filmography that it's probably still middle Mm. uh on his on the overall but his middle is still way better than most that's true Mm. what'd you think uh i loved it yeah um and i didn't walk out loving it i walked out thinking it was pretty good 
Interesting. And, yeah, I, 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 here's here's my thing, and, and this is coming from somebody who's not a Tarantino fan. Mm. Really, uh, I don't hate his movies; they just don't connect with me usually. Uh, I think one of the reasons this one did, and uh, I think I'm to the place where no, and Glorious is still my favorite, but it's second uh, for me right really? now. Really? Yeah. Um, I I think what it why it connects to me more than in the usual Tarantino movie. I think it's his most sentimental movie he's ever made it is and i and i think a lot of people are reacting to it i hear a lot of people talking about boring stretches and mm-hmm. you know just the i wasn't into the pace of it and that kind of stuff and i think it's just because he's exercising a different muscle for most of this movie than he usually does for his movies now the last 20 minutes of this movie it's Tarantino, the muscle Tarantino usually exercises, mm-hmm. right? But for a lot of this movie, there's a real sentimentality to it. There's an optimism to it. There's uh, it, the way he is shooting it. The fairy tale that he is telling is so um, empathetic and heartfelt. The way he treats Sharon Tate is so beautiful. It really is. Um, it's really, yeah. I just I fell in love with the Sharon Tate stuff. Uh, there. Well, well, I won't spoil uh, anything. Well, but. I'll, I'll tell you uh, a scene that's not spoiling that I, I you may be directly referencing. Her watching her own yep, movie. That's uh, the one. The Wrecking Crew. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. amazing. Uh, uh, she she comes. You know, like we see it in the trailer. She goes up to the box office and says, "I'm I'm in that movie," and she kind of has to prove it <laughs> because she's not well known. She goes in. She goes into the theater and. And her reacting to how the people are reacting to stuff that she's doing on screen is is it makes you fall in love with her all the way through this. And and uh, that was what I was coming out of it with, too. Yeah. Uh, with that scene comes up because I was like, man, you know, this scene is probably not important at all to the plot. But I'm so glad it's there. I, I think the same thing about the the DiCaprio and Pitt characters. They're given you live a day in the life with both of them, and it's there are moments that aren't necessarily plot essential, but they're so character essential. And I agree. I think this may be in the conversation for DiCaprio's best performance. I think he's incredible. I, I in think this it movie. is. I think I, it is his best performance. I, I, he astonished me, and in I this don't movie. even know if it's close. Um. Mm. Uh, I, I think, well, he was, I mean, he was incredible. No, he's in been great in a lot Django of things. Too, I'm just but, saying, I just think this is his best performance. Uh, Brad Pitt, I have other performances I like of him better, but he's so good here. He is almost his uh, Ocean's Eleven character. Yep. He's almost rusty in this, except with a little more butt kicking. A little, uh, little Aldo Rain in And there. a little less well, eating. I know. thought of... Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it is. It's Rain and Rusty kind of combined. I thought of uh, a little bit of true romance, too. Mm. Like his, <laughs> his, 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 yeah, his character on the couch <laughs> in, uh, in true romance. Cut and send me, man. Yeah. Can we just say 55-year-old stinking Brad Pitt shirtless on a roof is like one of the most gorgeous specimens of, of men I've seen. Absolutely. Like 55 years. Did you see how he was cut? Yeah. Like, I'm just like, and it just, it looked authentic. It just looked like, yeah, yeah that dude's built. He's, yeah. He's man. a pretty, he's a pretty man. He's yeah, a brick he house. Yeah. He's a brick house. Uh, there's a million things you can talk about with this movie. Uh, do you, do we want to do a spoiler thing? Why don't we keep this spoiler free? We'll keep it spoiler free, but. Uh, I will say there's uh, some other like non spoiler stuff. I love the kid actor that DiCaprio runs into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's who's, really that stuff good. Is great. Who's playing like a method? Who's who's already getting into the method at like eight years old? Yeah, almost uh, almost like a like a like a Haley Joel Osment. Who's... Almost like a young DiCaprio no. in What's Eating Gilbert Grape. <laughs> <laughs> your yeah. your girl, your the. Bumblebee. God damn it. Haley Steinfeld. Haley Steinfeld from True Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it's a good. Yeah, it's a good. He's, uh, you know, he, he, I love how they meet and how they sort of, sort of bond because she's sitting there reading a script. He comes in, he's wasting time. Like it's an hour he's got to waste. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he gets a, he comes over and he talks to her and she doesn't seem like she's into talking to him at all. But then he comes over and he starts reading this book mm-hmm. and then, you know, she starts becoming interested in what he's reading and, and and then he tells her what it's about and all that mm-hmm. and and uh and then, well, and then, then the book mirrors his own life yeah so yeah yeah although i thought i thought that he had made that up i wasn't what, sure oh, interesting. i yeah. wasn't sure that if if that was what he like the book was really about other than just he was relating his own life story it could be i didn't see the title of the book it's possible, but it it's so on the nose that I was I was saying yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. he gets so emotional when he's breaking down. There's know. a there's a great scene with DiCaprio uh playing off of Timothy Oliphant. Yeah. Uh, Holy cow, who's, who's also great. Yeah, yeah. Holy yeah. cow, the cameos in this movie. Oh, I know, I it's mean, insane. People are just stepping in for a line or two and you're like 
what are they doing here? <laughs> Sudden it's, Dakota Fanning. We have, well, yeah. and, and did you know, <laughs> like, and did you like uh, the the ranch with all the Manson yeah. kids? Like a lot of those are kids of famous actors. Yeah, yeah. Which is a real another interesting kind of had, like uh, uh, commentary. Yeah, you had Margaret Qualley, who's uh, Andy McDowell's kid, and uh, there were a couple others. I, I remember going over. I was like. Who? Where was she in this movie? Maya Hawk was in there for yeah, a second. Yeah, Maya yeah. Hawk. Yeah. Uh, but it was it, it's it's a lot like that. When you see it a second and third time, you're gonna pick up on a lot of the stuff. And everything. Bruce Dern's in there for a hot second doing. Some yeah, he's, yeah, he's stuff. got a funny scene. There, the the scene the scene at the Spawn movie ranch where Pitt shows oh. up is one of the tensest things that you'll ever see. It's Hitchcockian, man. Yeah. I've never seen Tarantino do Hitchcock this good. Like it was he's good with tension, but there this is ne- that's next level. You have level. no idea where that scene's going. No. no, it's just it owns you. Yeah. And even afterwards you don't even really know. You're just still kind of like I, I don't know what's going to happen oh, here. Oh, it's perfect. Well, in the way <laughs> the way the end of that scene shot is just yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It's yeah. just mm-hmm. like the whole way that's cut is just the the amounts of time you're on the certain cuts, the people you're following, when you're following. It's just and there's a long take in there that is that's you could tell that he got his rental money's worth out of his crane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's got some sweeping crane shots in this. Yeah, uh, but uh, but yeah, there's I don't know. I I actually don't know what people are talking about with this pacing thing. I know it's long. Uh, I, I just didn't feel I know it's almost three hours long. I really didn't feel it. I, but I didn't feel like it was that long I when I either. watched it. And there weren't any scenes that I was like, God, this is just dragging. Hmm. There wasn't anything like in there that that made me go. All right. Well, time to go to the bathroom right now because there's clearly nothing happening. Hmm. Uh, I didn't feel any of that. It is different from a lot of Tarantino. movies. Oh, sure. That's what it is. I think I just think it's it's different enough from how Tarantino usually paces his movies. But I just think the character work is so good. The world is so vivid. Every, listen, I mean, you know, when we send stuff, we pause and we look at. You don't have to do that with this movie. Tarantino did his homework. I can guarantee you, every single marquee is a movie that was out that day. Yeah. Every single thing you hear on the radio probably actually played on the radio in Los Angeles on that day. <laughs> like it just all feels like a real world, you know? Yeah, and uh, and there and the just the general like stuff that they were doing at the time, the the movies, the kind of movies that were coming out, Tarantino does sort of kind of a parody or satire or spoof of things that actually came out mm. out in, in that in that era stuff that's like super racist and like yeah. you know and like and and just the way things were cut there's a scene in the uh the uh, uh when it's the first uh, scene of that uh, tv show where he's playing the villain villain and everything where they cut to the three guys laughing <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. and it's such a sick 1969 <laughs> thing like the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know that type of thing in there and it's a uh, uh Talk about somebody who knows what he's... Well, and the shows he's talking about that he's cameoing in with Pacino, I mean, those are legit shows. Mm-hmm. I mean, and then they even show... They even incorporated him into an episode of the FBI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think that's a spoiler. Well, I read yeah. yesterday that whatever show DiCaprio was on before this takes place or during this movie, Tarantino wrote like half a dozen episodes of yeah, that I show. I wouldn't doubt it. And he, he wants to, have, he wants wants to, to film them. Yeah, he does. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't doubt it at all. Well, yeah, there's now, a, there's a lot of stuff. footage within footage in this movie. And talk about like uh you know we're the the heart of the movie. The, I mean that opening scene with Pacino where Pacino is kind of explaining to him mm-hmm. why they're using him the way they're using him. And yeah. I guess I won't get into that. But it actually I'm like that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And that actually makes me think back to like actors that were big that just popped up randomly in yeah. things. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. I totally get that rationale. And you just watch it destroy him in that conversation. It's just... It's brilliant. Yeah, and then, then, you know, and then he ends up... But um, I don't... Have I given my opinion? Um, My big three Tarantinos are always Jackie Brown and Glorious Bastards and Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. I think right now this would... I've only seen it once. I have a hard time. But I'm I'm saying this is fourth. And this is my favorite movie I've seen so far this year. And it is going to be really hard to beat. Hmm. It, I'm gonna go ahead and hit call my shot because I it's gonna be really hard. I to would beat say for this me. is probably fourth for me as well. Yeah, fourth or fifth. I mean, it's gonna be toggling yeah. back and forth between certain ones. But. but and I also think like Jackie Brown because Jackie Brown when it came out, you know, it followed up Pulp Fiction and it was criticized for pacing. Mm-hmm. It was criticized, which we haven't even gotten into for misogyny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. And it has since become, by a lot of people, one of their favorite movies of his. So I, I kind of wonder what this movie will be like 
in 22 years. I think there's there's you're right. There is some criticism, especially about the the last 20 minutes of yeah, you know, misogyny that kind of stuff. Um, I don't buy that as much as I buy the criticism about the Bruce Lee stuff. Which is I haven't even seen criticism on that. I'm his, not. I'm not surprised. Bruce Lee's daughter is pissed. Yeah, uh, I haven't even seen this. I'm not is surprised. Own, yeah, and I and I get it. Like yeah, I watched, that I, mean, I could get. I, I I get that part of it. Yeah, but, but uh, is is she pissed? Has she seen the movie? Yes. Yeah. Uh, now again, I'm the only guy in the room that hasn't. <laughs> From what I can tell, a lot of people believe the Bruce Lee scene in this movie is intentionally skewed through the eyes of Brad Pitt's character. It and is. he's remembering 100%. this guy being more of a braggart asshole I think that's fair, yeah. than he might have been in the actual event because he's trying to remember himself winning that mm. matchup. Mm-hmm. But she's not having it. Hmm. Hmm. It is interesting, interesting. because in, in other parts of the movie, this is not spoilery, the, it, it, he's shown to be a helpful mentor to the other actors. Yes. So he certainly doesn't come off as he does in that scene in different well and what's weird is i watched a film the other day pretty recent called birth of the dragon and it's about bruce lee's fight in oh, san I've francisco yeah, with yeah. uh wong jack yeah, yeah, or whatever I've seen that, yeah. and he's played as brash and braggadocious the entire movie because hmm. i even went and googled because i was like was he this much of an asshole in real <laughs> life and i went and googled and that was kind of his reputation so when i saw her slamming this tarantino film for that reason i thought well i thought other people think that too though mm. and i, I would think that's somebody that tarantino admires 100 percent. you would have to think and, he's a big bruce and, I mean, lee fan and, and you wonder how much of it is he's an asshole how much of it is he had to fight for every goddamn thing he did because there's the whole thing you know he was supposed to be in kung fu he came up with kung fu and then they go give it to david Carradine. Well, yeah and they give him yeah. the sidekick role yeah, in lone green, range uh, green hornet, hornet yeah as the ca- as um, K- uh, kato yeah. so yeah um we need to do some quick letter grades guys i i'm giving this a solid a mm. Mm. what do you think uh yeah i'm at an a i'm definitely at an a i mean i don't really give a pluses but this would be as close to that as you can get wow i liked it a little bit less than you guys <laughs> I, I mean, it's a b plus i liked it a lot um i think that's fair those uh well thank you yeah, well, i mean i don't mean that mean i just this is gonna be a Barry, very you divisive. have our permission to have your it's, opinion I'm it's, glad you it's liked actually it. not fair but anyway we've got to go on <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you liked there it. were things that I, I enjoyed myself a lot there were things that that uh, especially around the pacing that that i did uh find that it was a little i understand why i was there this is absolutely the movie that he wanted to make and i appreciate that it just there were there were spots where i was like you know if we trimmed off 10, 15 minutes of this movie, I understand it's not the movie that you guys would want. It's right. a movie that I would want. Ooh. Anyway, go fuck yourself. Um, we're going <laughs> to... Um, <laughs> no, uh, this that'll do it for this week. Uh, keep going to Sincast presented by Cinema Sins on Facebook. Uh, we have a Cinema Sins Twitter, MVS Twitter. Uh, we have Reddit. We have uh, we have a Patreon. We have, uh, was it uh, Discord? If you yeah. want to get on Discord, I might have to give you a, a private link to that through Facebook. Anyway, uh, we'd like to thank Aaron and Jonathan for showing yeah. up today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Absolutely fantastic when you guys can come out and uh, be in the studio. Uh, anything you want to pimp real quick? Yeah, come see it. Come listen to Behind the Sins. Yeah, sure. subscribe mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, good absolutely. stuff. We're over there being sexy. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you sell things, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott Barrett, share Aaron Dicer and Jonathan Watkins. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. There's a great episode of Friends where they're watching Old Yeller and Phoebe comes in and they, they learn... Her mother always shut it off before the sad parts at the end. <laughs> so <laughs> the movie keeps going. She's like, where are you going with that gun? What are you doing? <laughs> and then, of course, her mom did this with lots of movies. So she goes through trying to watch. She ends up watching uh, Pride of the Yankees. And she's like, then I got, I got Lou Gehrig's disease and I just couldn't carry on anymore. <laughs> 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 and Ross is like, you, you that was Lou Gehrig. You didn't kind of see it coming. <laughs> I think that was Aaron. Did you write that Lisa Sparks sin? Yeah. Yeah. So what? What was it? It was like uh, 
We made it this long in the Family Guy. Uh, without... We made it. We made it uh, to a minute and a half before the first Holocaust joke. Holocaust joke. <clears throat> so watch your step. So I said it was a record that would never be beaten, like Wilt's 100, Cy Young's 717, or Lisa Sparks 929. Yeah, and good for you for knowing that. But I, I didn't, didn't know not. that. I just researched, you know, weird porn record. Hold on. So you Googled what's the biggest gangbang of all time? Yeah. Well, no, I didn't. I didn't. I just did uh, like world uh, world record. I am sure like sex records. I'm I sure you'll be I... able to hear about this on behind the scenes. That's right. In a couple weeks. <laughs> well, I looked it up too because I had no idea who she was. Yeah. And so all I see is Lisa Sparks from Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I'm like, oh, oh she's a local gal. Let's <laughs> click on one of her videos, and like immediately. This face full of jism is looking back at me. <laughs> fucking, <laughs> I, it, I, it starts with with the the face. Like yeah, that should be at the end, right? <laughs> yeah, face full of jism. <laughs> All right, I know the title of my next movie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it went. I, I clicked off of it, but like I don't know if it went in reverse, which would be an interesting experiment, like to do a reverse porno. Where you start with the end, like Memento, and then yeah. and then you start seeing the the ejaculations go in mm-hmm. instead of out. Do you yeah. know what the top item is on Christopher Nolan's IMDb page? What a remake of Memento. Yeah, I saw that the what? other day. I don't. I, that's all I know. Is but it a live some, action remake? It's going to be an animated. I, um, I saw that the other day and I didn't quite understand. It seemed like one of those like, yeah, maybe he's doing it type project. Well, I but, clicked on it and it says a remake of the 1990 whatever film. That he's going to be directing? I don't even know. I just think that's wholly unnecessary. That what movie is holds he? up fine. Yeah, is no he kidding. Hitchcock? Yeah. Well, that movie's fine. He's like, well, you know, if I had better uh, materials back in the day when I made the first Memento, I would have made it this way. All right. well, who knows it could be it could be a completely different story and they're just calling it memento not memento two or maybe maybe i don't know two meant to and it's like one of those yeah. bands it's like one of those bands too that has fast, more than one memento. <laughs> memento kills yeah since we're probably not going to talk about it in the podcast proper like i have to say it blows my mind that i think maybe i'm the one who likes midsummer the most of everybody in cinema sins mm-hmm. that is really strange it's my me. it's no it's my number two movie of the year oh, okay so far. it's yeah. strange to me as well yeah, I, I, I maybe think it's just the daytime the, horror kind of thing. Page, but yeah. It's the just like that movie horror. blew. Yeah, like just it was just I I am so done and tired of stuff jumping out from corners and creepy things in the dark. And I am too. And, and, I, I mean, I am as well. And uh, Mid Midsummer is just it's all daytime horror and it's all. You, you see know, that trailer for the Lighthouse? No, I did. I, no. Yeah, that looks creepy. from the guy that made the Vavitch. No, I like oh. we're asking Aaron. Have you seen this trailer? It looks interesting, <laughs> doesn't it? It looks like he wants it to look like it was made in the 40s Mm -hmm. um it looks very interesting i don't know if i'm on board yet i didn't really like the witch so (laughs) but uh, But uh, also we've also got the babadook director's got a new one coming out next week. oh yeah i saw the preview for that um on uh once upon a time in hollywood i did too but I'm also um, with you. I've been debating the whole thing of just because something is symbolic or meaningful or metaphorical doesn't automatically make it good. Mm-hmm. It just makes it more interesting to me, so yeah. it has a better shot. I think um, I've also discovered that culty stuff, like the like cults and that kind of thing, is a part of horror that I find fascinating. But the same so thing happened with me when I, after I watched Hereditary, the when I first watched it, mm-hmm. I didn't like it, and then well, I didn't like it that much, and mm-hmm. then I watched it again, and I said, okay. I'm, I like it. I'm on board now. It really depends a lot of times on your uh, situation. I did not have a bad, I did not have a good situation watching Midsummer because I had a couple that was next to me that were talking all the way through. Oh. Um, I even, I even at one point feigned going to the bathroom so that I could move and, and get away from them, but I could still hear them. up uh. in there. And, uh, and I've gotten to the point now where I don't, I used to have tremendous balls about telling people to shut up. Mm not anymore not this is not in the we're not in the day and age where what like, happened your balls dropped <laughs> your balls my my balls dropped off <laughs> and uh and so like now uh people are so entitled about what they can do uh it you know i i could go and get management but then who knows what happens i'm they're waiting for me out in the parking lot now i don't want i don't care yeah i don't care enough about the movie to get to, to even have a hint of that situation. Yep. Do you guys sit in your assigned seats even if it's like 
somebody right next to you and there's others or do you just like move over i'll move over until there's a need to move i'll check the map and see if there's an open well yeah Ooh. first but then it, what happens a lot of times is that people will buy tickets yeah that's true you still could get screwed at the same time and they think mm-hmm. that they think that you're you know there's a seat next to them but you're buying that seat yeah there's seaters. a point in midsummer where somebody uh when then he's describing what happens to people after they turn like 72 or whatever right yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And uh, he's like, was like, well, and 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 there's like a a pretty obvious like, do you know what happens after they're seventy two? And I was like, yeah, okay, we don't need to. We, nobody needs to say anything. Nobody. I'm thinking the movie, right? But the guy next to me is like, you die. <laughs> and I was like, uh-huh. did he say this to you? <laughs> no, he says that to whatever whatever Hilda Beast he's with at the time. Yeah. And um I call those obvious talkers <laughs> yeah. that have to verbalize everything that the movie is obviously telling all of us just I to will, make sure we I know. I will say this about jump scares though. They can be done well and uh crawl is a good example. Oh, yeah? yeah. I still need to Aja's, see that. Aja's Aja's good with I heard, the jump scare. I heard crawl was pretty good. It's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Giallo's traditionally do involve like there is sex involved in a lot of them, but I think this might be the first one to ever take place in the porn industry. Oh yeah, it's porny as shit, man. It sounds it is, like you uh, could uh Boogie Nights double feature that 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 ish. Yeah, you know what? I, I've never seen Vanessa Paradis in anything, but she's really good. She's really good in this. Oh, and Orgasmo. God, there's so much cock and 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 <laughs> pussy and yeah. stuff in there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it could be one of them is hers yeah there's not a lot of cock and pussy in the 60s and 70s giallos i i, I don't watch a lot of modern day ones so mm-hmm. i i think so but yeah it's i right. don't know i don't know i got distracted there's a she yeah with the golden know. mouth with the gold oh god that fucking killed me mm-hmm. i'm just talking about all the porny stuff <laughs> yep yep but uh slowly but surely you were gonna take that reputation away from me oh I can't that's wait. delightful <clears throat> we should smoke a bunch of weed and watch these these shows yeah I've got a bunch I'm of I'm going to do half of that tonight anyway. <laughs> um, uh, should, should I guess which half? <laughs> do you need to? No. No. 